Mm. Mm. All right. All right. Dude. Day two. Day two, what? 11 days of reefing. Yesterday's conversation was awesome. Mm -hmm. Decades of experience. I'll compact it into 11 episodes, uh, all tracking uh, the same order as the original 52 weeks of reefing. That's right. Today we're covering episodes six through nine of the 52 weeks. You can find links to those old ones down in the in the uh, description below. But yeah, after this, I went and watched like two, after yesterday's, I went and watched two episodes to see what the hell you said back then. Oh, <laughs> you know what I should do that, actually. Yeah, that's pretty uh, interesting. interesting. Uh, the fastest way to the current evolution of the conversation. Yeah. So uh, this is, uh, might not seem fast. This way faster than collecting all this stuff on your own. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, all right. Again, man, we're thinking about the highest percentage outcomes. Uh, everything can work once. We get past that. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So today's inspiration, we've been taking uh, a little bit of inspiration from Doyle Brunson, we're Super System. Hey, right? you guys are in the poker uh, game, and for some reason, I am. He is. Uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of them out there. Today's he, quote. Today's quote from Doyle Brunson, <clears throat> so if I had a mentor, it was Johnny Moss. Right? I don't know what that one means, but we are talking about our own mentors. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I mean, he, he what, I'm reading this book, you know, mm -hmm. from him, learning a lot, you know, or I did anyway, back yeah. in the day. But it's important to remember that everybody learned what they learned from mm. someone somewhere, right? 100%. Yeah, and so who was Doyle's? Uh, uh, in fact, in this case, it was Johnny Moss. So in this case, I thought I would share, you know, who were uh, our mentors because going into this, you're gonna see how our mentors who we've selected have actually changed the way that we approach this because of the sources of information that we mm -hmm. get. Especially on the topics that we're covering today. There's that, definitely some pivotal changes when it comes to thought processes for these topics today uh, by the people that uh, we learn from. I'll let you go with yours first. <clears throat> so right. uh, who were your mentors as you learn more and more about reefing? Well, my mentor, my first mentor, I'll have to give it up to Mr. Ty, Ty Holburn uh, down in Kansas. He is the guy that got me into thing. I walked into the Petco. Uh, I wanted just a little freshwater tank and some guppies just to have something living in my uh, military barracks room. And, uh, and then I looked uh, and he's, there was all this you know, saltwater stuff, all this really gorgeous colored fish. Uh, they actually had a coral frag system in there because, uh, because the general manager guy, Ty, uh, who ended up being a good buddy of mine, uh, he was big into it. He had a, a garage full of tanks, like five, 600 gallons worth of tanks and corals and all kinds of stuff in his garage. So he brought that kind of, he had got himself allowed to get it in Petco. And then next thing I know, I'm talking to him. I'm over at his house in the garage, and here we go. I'm in the reefing game. <laughs> uh, next well, mentor. You, you know what? What? I'm going to share one because I have one similar yeah. to yours. And uh, I think this is actually an important one because you think of mentors, they must have like wrote in a book or done something like that. Yeah. Uh, and no, because mine, and you guys have heard me say this many times, is David Gregor, mm -hmm. right? I don't know. There's just something about the way that this guy holds himself that... Uh, made me want to listen to him. A, he was really kind and helpful to everybody on the local TC Mass forum. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the results in his uh, uh, own basement. He would frag corals, uh, but when he'd come to sell them at the frag swaps, he would only sell them for what he thought it took to actually make them. It yeah. wasn't to, uh, to make money, it was to get corals into people's hands. Dollars, mm -hmm. like ones of dollars and fives of dollars. Yeah, you know, he helped me uh, set up uh, the calcium alkalinity solution for the first time and actually a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing is like, it doesn't have to be some guy that wrote a book. It can be just somebody that, you know, willing did to, it well yeah. and was willing to share that information. With yeah, you. that's exactly what Ty was for me. Um, <clears throat> my next mentor, obviously, he's sitting right here next to me because I watched the 52 weeks of reefing. Uh, and then I, I really digested it all, mostly when I was uh, in Africa building my own tank when I was deployed to Africa. Uh, so I had my tank up, but then I was really getting into the 52 weeks, uh, all the other videos and everything. So uh, you sharpened my steel when it came to um, my reefing knowledge and my game. Um, and then, you know, I read, uh, I was a, a lot on forums and I was a lot on, you know, the, well, I did read, I was in Reef Central, local forums, Reef Central, Reef to Reef. 
And this one guy kept popping up in like all of my questions and uh, about chemistry and you know the, the science behind the chemistry, all this other stuff. And I actively every time I had a chemistry question, actively sought out what Randy Holmes Farley had to say about it. Read the articles on uh, the was it Reef Keeper or whatever they wherever the articles were. Uh, read all of his articles. Went a lot of it went over my head, so I had to read it like four or five, six times for it to actually sink in. But uh, he was a mentor of mine that I just I have a qu question about chemistry or water chemistry or how this interacts with something. Let me go see what Randy says first, uh, and then I'll I bet formulate you my a own. A lot of people that can say that about Randy Holmes Farley. Yeah, uh, really pivotal guy in the industry. And then. Uh, this one uh, is for me personally, I don't know how many, he probably doesn't even know, he's one of my mentors, but uh, uh, Russ M, or Russum is what I always pictured him in his head. And I've had a call, I've talked to him on the phone a couple of times now that he's here. But <clears throat> when I read through the 180 some page uh, Neptune manual, uh, there was these little footnotes and I kept seeing this, you know, this Russ guy's name pop up. And then I joined the Neptune Community Forum and Russ and uh, Aquamaniac, I believe is another guy, those two. Uh, but Russ, um, he, Russ M, he constantly, I mean, he was the one that would give you the answers to any question you could imagine. You'd post uh, your little blurb of, of Neptune code back when it was uh, a little more in depth to try to program these things. And he would, uh, he'd spend two minutes or two seconds to go, no, nah, this is why, this is wrong, and here's why that logic isn't right, and here's an actual better one. Uh, mm -hmm. So when it actually came to learning the Neptune, and uh, for my own sake, because I'm a gear junkie, Russ was one of my mentors, a big mentor of mine, that I took a lot of his uh, programming advice from. Now I have him on speed dial. <laughs> but. Right on, man, right on. You know, I want to throw one and th address the thing out. You, you know, you said my name in here. And I have never, ever been comfortable with being thought of as anybody's mentor, as oh, odd, yeah? odd as that is. I, know, I mean, I know that, like... like the, everybody, you know, everybody watching will probably say, yeah, I was Ryan. I don't know, man. I just, like, I just mm. want to learn something new and share it with people. And I guess the process of that kind of creates that world. But yeah. I... I I'm just going to say it out loud. Like, I've never really feel, like, worthy, hmm. right? <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Like, I, at times, like, question myself even. Like, yeah. you know, why is it people listen to me? You yeah. know? Like, <laughs> uh, and the reality is that everybody has self-doubt in that manner, right? Yeah. Uh, even the greatest. Uh, you got to see a little bit of behind the scenes there for a second. There's, but pro there's probably more people that uh, <laughs> see you as a mentor than you had ever than you could imagine. That's the same thing with like Russ. I bet you Russ doesn't know he's a mentor to anybody except for here I am calling him out because like you really helped me. You know what actually <clears throat> just came to mind is a quote. I can't remember who I saw. Maybe somebody can share where I, they probably heard this quote too. But like anybody who actually wants to be president mm. is inherently disqualified <laughs> to do that job well. <laughs> I think actually that might be uh, from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> I think about it. But anyway, I, I, I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, maybe I should embrace it instead. Uh, who knows? Uh, I wrote down some things here, too. I also had Randy Holmes Farley as well. Uh, mm -hmm. It was really close uh, tie for me with uh, da David Greger. Uh, everything about chemistry that I learned, I went and read all of his articles. Yeah. I went later on and read a bunch of water chemistry books. Uh, mm -hmm. I got like WQA certified. Once I understood all of that stuff, I could understand Randy Holmes Farley stuff better. <laughs> you know, I, you know that was like a big source of information. You know that you know eventually just kind of became general knowledge because he did such a good job of uh, getting that stuff out yeah. there. Yeah. And what he did is it exposed, you know. The we we shifted from the thought process of super buffer deluxe yeah. to like you know what? it's baking soda yeah you know and how that works chemically it's not like yeah. a, a a law you know it's not like a you know maybe plausible log it's logical and it's plausible no like he broke it down to this is exactly why this does this. Mm -hmm. Super easy to understand. You know, and, and ev this is a good point because every one of these mentors serve a different purpose for me. Mm -hmm. Like, so Randy Holmes Farley, understanding the science, yep. the like water chemistry, yep. like what's happening inside of uh, the things you can't see. 
but this is also somebody who doesn't like actually maintain a ton of tremendous amount of tanks. Yeah. So like I'm not looking to him for husbandry you right, know, right, right. or application knowledge. I'm mm -hmm. looking for the science so that once I understand how something works, it's more likely that I'm going to be able to apply it. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Okay. Uh, uh, Dana Riddle. So this guy, if you're wondering, I like you know I. I want to like go through his, every one of his articles, like create a like a summary for it because it's all written, really really hard to decipher to be honest. Yeah. But if you go to the conclusion and you read the end, you're like, oh, wow. I know, I know where right, this is going to go. Now I can go read through it. I understand. <laughs> uh, but it's it's very much you know a scientist writing for other scientists, yeah. uh, not yeah. necessarily writing for the end user or our hobby. But the fact of the matter is, if you go read all of his material, like we're still asking questions that he answered 14 years ago. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I don't know why are we even asking this anymore. He's already <laughs> proved it. Like, why did nobody see this? You know. <laughs> so I don't know. I looked at him uh, all the time, and, and one of the things that really comes to mind. I mean, there's so many, but one just pops out is ending the discussion, like, you know, people are like, how much par do you need? And they go measure the par out in the ocean, and the ocean's 2,000 par, you know, at midday. Like, well, that must be the goal, right? Yeah. Anything less than that, we're, we're gonna starve them. Well, then he goes and proves that actually, most of these mm -hmm. corals actually do the highest rates of photosynthesis at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Yeah. You know, I'm, like, I'm making those numbers up. But, but like, in the morning Very in the small evening. areas of the day, and guess what the par is in that area? Yeah, that it's time. actually shading itself and yeah. protecting itself uh, and slowing down photosynthesis during the peak hours of the day. Like, huh. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so, I, I don't know, Dana Riddle, man, everything that I've ever uh, seen uh, uh, every article changes the way yeah. that I think about things. Go watch him. turbocharge photosynthesis. Uh, you don't hear this name very often anymore, but Anthony Kelfo uh, mm. was a propagation, you know, inspiration to me. Uh, I sat do through one of his se seminars at a uh, uh, iMac, and you'll probably see this inspiration inside of some of the videos about. Uh, chopping up anemones. So oh, yeah, 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 from back I in the day. I sat down and he's like, yeah, dude, there's no reason to ever pull another anemone out of the ocean because I can divide these things once a month. Two becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, 32, and yeah. so on. And he's like, you can actually produce a 1,000 anemones a month within one year. Yeah. And that was the inspiration to go and uh, set up those uh, four by eight foot uh, frag tanks in my basement. Ah. And I'm like, ah, this could be a chance for... Uh, what is my hobby to maybe turn it into a career? Now, that was a total failure on my end. <laughs> uh, but also, Kelfo, uh, you know, he had a book. It was uh, a little loosely lit written, I would say. But yeah, uh, yeah. there's so many little gems inside of his propagation book. And then when you met him, the cool part was how humble he was. Mm. You know, there was a bunch of like famous guys at the time that I would meet from these things. But I'll be frank, a lot of them were pretty full of themselves. Yeah. And so when you met, you know, Calfo and how humble he was is like, ah, oh, man, like a refreshing, somebody who just wants to share knowledge. He had the same thing on, uh, he had that like forum on Reef Central, mm -hmm. super duper helpful. Uh, another one, Julian and Del Beek. Okay, Reef uh, Volume 3, uh, Reef Aquarium Volume 3, oh, yeah, changed yeah. the way that I reef for sure. Never read it. Really? Uh, yeah. Maybe because you got it from the videos. I don't know. I did, yeah. I was <laughs> videos and forums. I read that thing cover to cover more than once. Uh, one, I was sitting on a beach actually in Hawaii and read it cover to cover. <laughs> uh, because like when you're like thinking about it and you're going snorkeling and stuff and you can see why the technology actually works to emulate things in the ocean. Mm. Like it uh. was like, the first time when I was reading about lighting in there, and he's like, yeah, there's three types of lighting. There's the sky, the sun, and then the, it's not shimmer, but. Uh, oh, those uh, caustic? Caustic lines, caustic yeah. Lines. Mm -hmm. And then I went and stuck my face in the ocean, and I'm like, ah, you know what? Uh, the sun isn't even up, but it's lighting up the sky. It's 6 a.m. in the morning, I'm going snorkeling, mm -hmm. and I can see everything here. The sky is what's illuminating it. And then I was like was doing the same thing and then like a cloud passed over, covered up the sun entirely, yet put my Still face, light. everything's super bright. It's not the sun. Yep. And the sun is actually just illuminating, uh, uh, breaking up inside of the atmosphere and illuminating the whole earth with this blue light. Mm. Uh, and then the shimmer lines, you can go see it. They're like, oh, no, all this stuff comes together. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It was really interesting. Julian uh, Sprung and Delbeck. Okay, Victor and Josh over at Worldwide, mm. right? Uh, going there and seeing somebody who grows corals for a living. Yeah. And right. so here's the piece about growing for a living. If you grow for a living, 
Uh, you have to do it fast, you have to make them colorful, you have to do them the best, otherwise nobody's gonna ever buy these things from you. Oh right? yeah, right? yeah. So uh, you'll either lose your old stock or uh, nobody's just gonna buy from you. You have to have really high success rates, otherwise you're mm -hmm. gonna go out of business. Yep. And so like when they shared all of that knowledge, you know, Victor shared, you know, like some tidbits that just really stuck in, man. That stability his, piece. Yeah, right? his approaches that have got him to the point where he can do this at a big scale. Flow is more important than lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all <laughs> kinds of different things that they shared. And so when Victor and Josh spent all of that time, you know, on the phone, yeah. in person, yeah. uh, flying out here, like, he changed the way, both of those two changed the way that I would reef because I learned something brand new from them. Uh, I will say the same thing about Elliot at, at Marine Collectors. He's Open, changed, ch completely changed the way that uh, you think about fish and fish quarantine and health and stuff like that. I'll never think about it the same. Yeah. I will never think about quarantine the same. I will never think about husbandry the same. I will never think about habitat the same. Mm. I will never think about any of this the same because somebody has started to impart wisdom to me on how you actually take care of these animals. And to be frank, I was more concerned about the corals before he's introducing me to a new world. Yeah, right? easy. Uh, humble fish I as well. Like, I don't know humble fish in person, mm -hmm. but like, I went and read his, his uh, uh, website again the other day. Yeah. And the ick eradication versus ick management. Well, and then all actually d details about uh, how, how to treat all of these things. And it's getting better and better every, every time I read a new version <laughs> of it. Uh, because it's more helpful and more, you know, precise to the user. Like, a lot of the times the quarantine people are writing articles and they're covering their butts and like, you know, this doesn't work all the time. And then they're giving you 15 ways to do the exact same thing. Mm. When what we really all want to know is, tell me the way that you would do it. I want to go do that. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't need to know the 15 different ways. I just need to know the best path to success that works in the 80-20. You know, 80% of the results are 20% of the effort. Yeah. Uh, and tell me that. But when you go there, you can get both from him and you can see it. And like, so I would say right now, I don't know that much about you know, fish disease and treatment because essentially that's becoming like a veterinarian uh, yeah. you know, for fish. I don't know that much about it. But everything that I've learned, man, I'd say 60% of it has been from reading some of Humble Fish's comments. It uh, really stuck with me. 40% probably from Elliot. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. There's probably 10% somewhere from you know, who, who knows where. So those are some of my mentors. And so I just thought it would be helpful to start off. Like, you, know, you can understand where some of this stuff is coming from, you know, as we learn more and more about reefing. Mm -hmm. All right. So today, episode six, what is it? So we're starting episodes, we're starting with the 52 weeks of episode six. It's called Wiring Your Reef Tank everything you forgot to think about. And we have a core belief, and this one is true. I mean, I, I, raise your hand oh. if your first tank was called a rat's nest. Oh, uh, 100%. Actually, you know what we called it here? Cord octopus disaster. <laughs> and it like pretty much uh, sums it all up, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is the core belief. What everything uh, you'll hear today kind of sums up and builds into. Mm. Clean, is synonymous with safe. Yes. I, end, end of story. If you go look at it and you cannot see a cord and everything's managed really well and it just looks super clean, bet you it's safe too. Yeah, I mean obviously there's a loophole in there somewhere if you wanted to go looking for it, but I would say 99% of the time, if you go look at it and say, man, that looks clean, it's inherently safe. It's inherently well. safe. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, what matters most in terms of wiring your tank, uh, everything you forgot to think about, number one? Uh, what we believe matters most, uh, first thing, is the amp capacity. And I don't know how many times I've plugged in you know, a power strip or a whole bunch of different things on, like I got a, you know, an L-shaped corner in my house. I've got some outlets over here and I got some outlets over here. We kind of spread them out and then go to turn a light on or turn a heater on or something kicks on and poof, everything dies. It's like, 
Well, everything on that those two walls were tied to the same 15 amp fuse. Uh, do you really think that one 15 amp fuse can handle the entire tank? No, but you uh, yeah. you solved it in your own house. Oh yeah, I put it in a whole bunch of circuits. Uh, <laughs> it can though. Uh, so, but just think about it. Like, yeah. uh, how many watts is each one of these things? And kind of like think about it. Like, well, what if they were all on? What would At happen, the exact right? same time, yeah. And like, what happens? Like, what else is on that circuit? Like, what if it's plugged into my entertainment system and I decide mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. jam some Jimi Hendrix? Uh, <laughs> you know, what will happen then? Uh, and so. Yeah, amp capacity, and you don't want to like ride the you know the the, no. the edge just because it doesn't turn off. Because eventually, like let's say you had a 15 amp and you were running 17 amps through it and it didn't trigger. Uh, well, a there's a little bit of safety issue there, but mm -hmm. b someday it's probably going to flip and it will happen when some lights or something turns on and yeah. you're not around. You might not be around. Yeah, so think about the amp capacity, and there's a lot of ways that you can do that. You can fix that. Uh, one, uh, if it happens to be on a circuit, there's other stuff. Well, maybe you could run, you know, your entertainment system off of a different plug, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe when you add, like, you got to think about it. Can I add a new outlet some way without like destroying my You're house? You're ripping up the walls and uh, all that other stuff. Yeah. Usually, it's going underneath the floor is mm -hmm. probably the best way in a basement or crawl space and popping it up. Uh, but you know, there's two ways to do it. Can I get it to where the tank is? Uh, or can I put the tank somewhere there's already multiple? Would that be yeah, a better idea? Split between a few breakers. But what if I can just put another, like, what if I can't get to where the tank is? What if I can put another outlet where the home entertainment is? You know, then, then I can pull that off of it. Yeah, yeah. And then also, like, don't plug your vacuum into that outlet. <laughs> uh, you know, so, I don't know. Uh, that's one of the things to really think about to begin with is uh, amp capacity. And... You know, sound, putting a new uh, outlet in your house sounds expensive, but if you, mm. you know, find the right guy to do it, it isn't really as expensive as it sounds. Or in, in most cases, if you just ask your friend circle, somebody will probably know how to do it, yeah. actually. So uh, go ahead. Well, I mean, this all goes back to higher paths of success here is, what, is why we believe this stuff matters the most. And mm -hmm. second one, next one up that matters the most uh, leads you to a higher path of success in reefing. Everything needs to be removed at some point. La yesterday we told you that every piece of gear fails. Everything will fail, but even more so in a saltwater environment. Here's the next part of that. Uh, your wiring and everything you forgot about, well, when you forgot that you zip tied a hundred different points of your cord's nest all the way through so it looks really clean, guess what happens when that skimmer pump or that one pump fails uh, or breaks or you need to take something out for maintenance? I have to go and clip all of those little things, trace the thing all the way back, and then uh, clean it, and then put it all back to where it was. There's better options out there. Zip ties, dead to me. Don't use them. I'll never use zip ties Don't again. use them. Velcro. Uh, even the ones that are like kind of allow you to open and close, they yeah. tend to fail. Uh, and so I'd, I would never ever use zip ties again because what happens is the first time you set it up with zip ties, it will look It meticulous. looks great. It looks oh, beautiful. Man. You've hidden everything really, really well. One solid snake. Yep. yep. Uh, you got a bunch of zip ties going down, and it just looks clean. really, really clean, right? Uh, but then one day you're like, oh, you know what? My power monitor is telling me to clean my return pump, but F no. <laughs> uh, you know, there's no way, man. I'm going to cut that all apart. Mm. Okay, so uh, what I use now is exclusively is like little zip. I've tried the little like round clippies that stick on. Anything that like requires a adhesive pops off Terrible over time. Terrible in salt water, yeah. Yeah. So what I do now is just uh, these zip or there's strips. Velcro strips. Yeah, there's a little strip and... Uh, it, there's a, a little hole in the top of the tab, and so all you do is you know wrap it around your cords, run it through the hole, tighten it up, and zip tie it. I mean, it's seconds to put on and seconds to take off. Some of them also have like a little uh, tab on the end that you can screw into into the yeah. uh, wood mm -hmm. or whatever, so that it actually does hold it in place as well. It's really I, nice. Sometimes you need to use a little washer or something to make sure it doesn't go through. But it, Velcro uh, or I don't know, any kind of hook and loop type thing. I wonder we should I wonder if we should look into sourcing these for the website just because they're that that great. I mean you can you find you can yeah. find them anywhere, but you know convenience. There's a bunch of stuff that we carry that you can find anywhere too, but 
That type of thing is always always cheaper, like a Home Depot, but maybe convenience. Uh, yeah. It'll be a dollar more expensive here. Yeah. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, uh, all right, so the adaptive reef boxes are both clean and safe. And so the adaptive reef boxes, you see them in our normal videos, like mm -hmm. it has the apex and the little monitor and the outlets and everything. Part of it's just bling. You can use them for anything. It doesn't have to be like branded stuff, mm -hmm. but get, getting your gear up and off of the ground and with drip loops and nice and neat, uh, that's one of the best ways to get it done. Yeah, so you by far don't need a box, man, to make no. this happen. But like, here's the thing, is like you're gonna have a massive amount of power bricks, massive. you're gonna have all of these cords, mm -hmm. and they gotta go somewhere. You know, where are they all gonna go? Is it gonna be a big, big pile in your sump? Or can I put them inside of a box? And then like, not only will it look cleaner, uh, but it's also going to be safer because the water isn't going to travel down the cords in the same way when yep. you have it all routed in there. Yeah. So, adaptive reef boxes. Uh, I would say, you know, it's one of those things that doesn't sell really well because you don't, you can't really visualize. You see this black box and you're like, well, what would I do with what it? What would I do with that? And it's funny because then we, I told the team the other day to like go gray out what the apex looks like on it. And then uh, they all sold in the same day. Once you have the <laughs> inspiration of what you're going to do with it. So uh, mm. uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, all right. So uh, another one is the power supply brackets are best. So mm. uh, there, you can get a bunch of these. You can get them. Basically, they are just like a, a little clip that goes on the outside of your power block or there's, bar. There's people know. that I think there's... Uh, you, 3D printed versions. Uh, there's you know, it, 3D here? printed. No, yeah, okay. there's 3D printed instructions for you to print your own. Uh, one of the, I mean, once we found Ecotex and used Ecotex that fit every, every size power brick you could imagine, uh, and how easy they are. They already got sticky tape on the back, so once you tighten it, everything up, you put it on there, and now it's stuck to the wall, and you can drill it in. So easy. So let me give you an idea. We don't have a picture of this. So let me give you an idea of what you're talking about. So everybody has a whole bunch of those, like a you know DC power adapter blocks, right? Yep. Yep. Big uh, squares. And they usually just sit all over the ground. They're little cord freeways because where else are you gonna put them, right? Uh, these things are just little metal brackets that go on the ends of your you know power block, yeah. right? Uh, and they have little hooks on them and go around the edges and the Velcro on them. What's kind of cool though about these ones specifically, actually, can you pull that picture up, Yeah, Dave? All right, sweet, he's gonna have a picture of this in a second. So what it allows you to do is mount, you know, all six or all 10 of them, all linear, really clean, really easy. You can zip tie, or not zip tie, uh, Velcro the, the cords along with it. And what's cool about them the most thing is when you said is there's little stickers in the back, yep. so you can put it on there, Velcro it, stick it to the wall, unvelcro it, take it off, and then put the screws in, and it's always perfect every time. Yeah, because otherwise, uh, you who knows if you're straight, uh, if it's square, you know, all this other stuff here. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Hey, these things, if you're worried about wiring your tank, uh, everything you forgot to think about, you forgot to think about these. <laughs> uh, you know, they're they're you know these ones are I guess 18 bucks a piece. Uh, you can For find 3D printed ones. I don't know if they'll have the sticker, and they'll obviously be plastic instead of metal. But uh, there are cheaper versions of this. I won't do a tank without these things mm. now. Uh, like I need everything well, put away, has a home, and easy to remove Velcro straps. And, and especially when you use them in uh, adaptive reef boxes that we just talked about, and you put them, you can take the back side of the adaptive reef box or the front side off, mount all of these power bricks, and then uh, plug everything in and make all the cords really nice. And everything goes back into that adaptive reef box so, so smooth. You, if you have the patience and the time to do it, makes it safe and easy. Next one, we're violating right behind us, but I'll share the wisdom behind it anyway. The which water? Is avoid 110. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, there's another one there. Avoid 110 over the tank. Right, yeah. so that's a 110 volt uh, going to kill you uh, electrical so, supply above the tank. So thinking, thinking about this isn't like avoid having lights over your tank because uh, you know, most of these lights are DC, so they get uh, the AC transferred into DC. So that's not 110 watts at the plug-in of the Kessels or the Ecotex or the you know the Neptunes and stuff like that. This is having uh, something that doesn't have a power brick or a D it's not DC powered or what have you. That is straight 110 from the wall over the over the tank. Uh, 
What's the so, DC stuff? If it fell in the tank, it wouldn't electrocute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the 110, does, you will fry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, what we're, we're, we're violating it here is these, uh, um, what are these? The hi- T5s. The, yeah, the T5 uh, hybrid type adaptive or uh, add-on kits. Mm-hmm. That is straight 110 to those T5 lamps. So there was a world in the past with halides and T5s where you always had to have 110. It, just the way it was. I will tell you, I had a close call with this at one point in time. Uh, I dropped, I had a PC bulb over a, that big frag tank mm. in my basement and the cheap little Coralife uh, plastic legs on there snapped while I had my hands in the tank and the whole thing fell in. I thought I was dead <laughs> and I was like, well, why am I not electrocuted? And it's because I had a dry lock floor down. And so I had like these uh, rubber uh, Mm. uh, thing through the floor and then it had plywood on top of it and uh, there was no ground and I was wearing shoes and stuff too. So I just happened to not be grounded when it happened. But if I was, dude, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So uh, if, if you can, I would say Either respect the fact that you have 110 over the tank. Do whatever it takes to make sure that that cord is solid up above the tank. And if it were to come disconnected, it will not fall. Like zip tie it, do whatever it takes to keep that that power up above the water. Now that I know what I know, I'd be a little less comfortable even using those toggle bolts in the ceiling with 110 Mm. over the tank. If I know I'm gonna have my hands in it, I mean, it's just drywall between me and dying. Yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> if you're screwing it into a stud, but the chances the studs are spaced evenly, I guess you could put up actually a little bit of a... Crossbar. You could put a crossbar, mm-hmm. like a decorative bar on the ceiling and then screw into that and then into the studs. But, you know, think about 110. Uh, I, I will say there's a there's actually a... a you, know, you think of like, well, LEDs are all safe then because they all have those power blocks. Is that true? There's a a lot of cheaper LEDs where the power There's no power brick is actually inside the light. Yeah. So if, if yours just has a cord that goes right to the wall to the wall, that means you have one ten over straight the straight to it. So just think about it uh, and <clears throat> either avoid it if you can or respect it if you can't. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, speaking of water and electricity, here's a. Uh, what we believe matters most in everything you forgot about wiring your reef tank, water doesn't travel up. I mean, in some cases it can Sometimes wick, it wicks, it would, yeah. But not up a cord. Not up a cord into the outlet and through, no, so. And yeah, like some kind of fibrous material maybe it could, but yeah. in a vast majority of cases, water doesn't travel up, which is, you know, when I, when I do a drip loop, on a cord, uh, I'll just throw this mic up here, hopefully I don't make a bunch of noise with it. Uh, <laughs> right now, if it if water hit it, it would just travel down this like a freeway. And yep. It would just stick to it and go right into the outlet. However, if I put a little loop in it, it will just drip and fall right off the bottom mm. there. And so the drip loop thing is important. And like sometimes you have it actually as a coil to make sure. Sometimes it, it's just a little bit of a bend. But the bend, you know, you should, you know, attach it to the wall in that bend or it won't keep that bend, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, often like with those, like those, uh, you know, adaptive reef boxes by sending them up through the bottom or just mounting, you know, uh, the, the power bar above the sump in most cases will actually force the cords in the sump to like go upward yeah. rather than downward. Yeah. So just think about that and when you're installing all of your gear, the water generally doesn't travel up and you can solve a lot of safety stuff just by considering that. Yeah, you know, I would, uh, if I were to you know, go down that path of building another tank at home or what have you, I would actually personally just uh, move my outlets for the tank uh, up to about three feet, four feet high, which helps you force you into a drip loop because I'm not sending my power straight down here. Uh, absolutely, if you're gonna put in a new outlet, the, the outlet can actually be Make it higher. a little taller, yeah. yeah. Mm. All right, uh, another one is uh, spread the load. Uh, <laughs> and so that could be either in your power bars, it could be in the Apex uh, EB32, yeah. EB832. Uh, it could be anything. Like, so if I have, you know, two heaters that are both 600 watts, well, 
plug them into different things. Right. Don't put them all in the same outlet. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, and and note that a lot of the outlets that are designed to turn on and off, you know, like a you know a controller. Like you definitely don't want to like plug two of them into one, you know, like 1200 watts, it is going to chew through the electronics in that outlet much, much, much faster <laughs> than if you had split it up into two. Yeah. Oh, I, I've, I've learned that one the hard way uh, by constantly flipping, uh, breaking breakers into the point, or flipping breakers into the point where I like had an electric, uh, just an extension cord running from another side of the room underneath through the car or underneath the carpet back over and probably ne that goes back to some of these uh, uh, being safe and clean and whatnot that was definitely not safe the next one here is the kilowatt I don't know if anybody knows what a kilowatt is but it's just this little like I don't know twenty dollar or so box do we sell the kilowatt here yeah, uh, maybe we'll find a picture of yep, it actually yep, yep. Uh, so the, the the kilowatt thing actually monitors the amount of power that you're consuming yep. here. Yeah, that guy right there, it's 22 bucks. Uh, and so I would call it, uh, what, what we believe matter most is the kilowatt is more than a nice to have. All you gotta do is plug your power bar in there or a specific pro, uh, or a piece of gear and you'll find out immediately how much draw a juice you're actually pulling out of that outlet, right? Okay, you can find out, you know, like we talked about it yesterday, that you could, you know, monitor your performance of your pumps this way. Uh -huh. But also, I can plug my whole power bar into this thing and find out with everything on, what's the what's, total amount of juice yeah, that I'm using. What's it drawing? Then you know, like, ah, it's too much, or it's right on that razor's edge. Let's split some of these off. So what a lot of people are doing is plugging it all in, and if it didn't trigger my breaker, I must be safe, <laughs> that's, right? That's bad. But if you know that your breaker is 15 amps and this thing says 16, even though the breaker isn't tripping, it just hasn't tripped yet, right? <laughs> uh, and so you should really think about uh, one of these things, 22 bucks, you can actually find out how much power. It's great for maintenance. And you know mm -hmm. we mentioned uh, many times that as you, if you have a 30 watt pump, if it's dirty, despite what you might think, you'd think that it'd be harder for the little turbine to spin uh, and may suck up more power. Actually, when it's dirty, it spins slower and sucks up less power, mm -hmm. right? So you'll know uh, on that front. But uh, kilowatt is partially about safety. It's partially like knowing what you're doing, and you can start to do it intelligently at that point as well. Uh, another what we believe matters most here, if, if it's possible to happen, it will happen. We, uh, we talked, again, we talked about uh, this one uh, a little bit yesterday in that uh, redundant tank and redundant tank safety. And it just take that, it's that taking that time to figure out, you know, if this happens, then what? Well, same thing here with power and wiring your tank. Like, if water were to travel down that cord, would it be safe? And you look at it and you go, yeah, but it's not traveling down the cord now. No, but if it could happen, it will happen eventually. Yeah, long enough timeline, you're just waiting. You're just waiting for the time bump. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Like uh, I've seen this many times where, uh, it, you know, you had the old days, you had a, like a little clamp on light for a refugium ball. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Clamp it right on your sump or on right the top of some. 110 sitting right over the water, <laughs> right? And the worst yet is it might fall in there and not kill everything until something else grounds it. And the thing that will ground you will be when you put your hand in the tank. <laughs> uh, and so it might have fallen in there. So if, it's, if you're deciding that a little $3 clamp is the thing between you dying or not dying, think again, because a long enough timeline that thing's gonna fall in. <laughs> uh, also, like for me, I knew when I put that Coral Life fixture with those super cheap legs, Little that thin. those legs had broken on me an unbelievable amount of times already as I was trying to pull it on and off. Like, uh, I knew when I did it, this isn't <laughs> safe. And then sure enough, it very much wasn't. And only a couple other decisions saved my life. Yeah. So uh, think about that. If, if it's possible to happen and you're looking at it like, ah, I'll get to that later. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so hard lessons uh, learned. We actually kind of heard a couple of them already through here, but yep. Spirit of wiring your tank, everything you forgot to think about, hard lessons, don't do these. Hard lesson number one, electricity outage in, in your neighborhood, uh, a breaker or an outlet or a power bar. They will happen and uh, you should be prepared for it. Yeah, when you think of electricity outage. It's not it, just like, it's not just the power grid in your neighborhood failed. Yeah. We've, we learned that here in the, 
we've learned this on, on all these different types of levels here in BRS. The 750XXL, uh, it wasn't the power that went out around because all the other Apexes were saying, hey, I'm good to go. It was that one GFCI outlet that flipped and luckily the warehouse was working here on the weekend. They came in and saw everything off. Yeah, so some noisy piece of equipment that was failing and the, te and the uh, system set off the breaker yeah. and it was done. Uh, so yeah, when you think of power edges, don't think just about like uh, lightning struck a tree down the street uh, or somebody drove into the tree. Uh, it's the breaker, it's an outlet, it's the $3 bargain, you know, power bar. Power strip bought. thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, like, so look at the power bar and see how much power it can actually take. And if you're riding the razor's edge of the maximum amount in these things, uh, well, you're gonna get razor edge results. You know? <laughs> uh, also, uh, we said this yesterday, low density neighborhoods are the last to get power fixed. Mm. I, I assume this is true nationwide, it's definitely true in Minnesota, but... It just feels so plausible. That yeah, if the power came out and, uh, you know, they got to go put up wires up again, mm -hmm. and one wire will get 10,000 people's power on, and one of them will get uh, 40, they go to 10,000 and they'll go and so on and so on to get to 40. So if you look around your neighborhood and see, like, wow, nobody lives out here but me. That's me. Uh, you're last, man. <laughs> you might be out for uh, days I rather than hours uh, in many cases. <laughs> so the power solution, backup solution should match mm. that. Most people that live in high density cities and stuff, your power will probably never be out for more than eight hours. Yeah. And so, you know, the solutions can match that. Mm. Mm. Well, and talk, talking about prevention, one of the hard, you know, a hard lesson to learn that you don't, that you want to prevent is uh, generators. They, they work, they work great. But they only work if you uh, maintain them or if you keep up with them. Uh, how many times do you think, like back over the past five to 10 years, how many times did my power actually go out? It's probably on one hand and maybe even less than uh, one of these five fingers. And so you think, okay, well, I've had this generator. I got a generator, it's good to go. But if you're just, if it's sitting for 10 years out in your garage or in your shed or in your basement or where have you, uh, and you've never really turned that, run that thing over a couple times a year or changed the oil or what have you, or replace the gas that's in it, uh, might yes. not work when you go pull the thing. Yeah, the, if you didn't get perfect uh, uh, attention to getting all the gas and stuff out of between, it's all gonna gel in there yeah. and the carburetor's gonna yeah. jack. So think about it in this spirit. Or stabilize. If you have, everybody knows what it's like to own a lawnmower, a weed whacker, uh, <laughs> you know, a chainsaw. If you hadn't started one of those things uh, in five years, what are the chances that it's going to start Fire when you pull right it? Up. Mm, pretty low. Zero. <laughs> pretty right? Low. Really, like you're just going to get lucky at that point. Yeah. You, you had the reason that it works at, in five years from now is because you were meticulous about getting all of the, uh, the gas, gas out. out of it. And that means not just running it till it's empty. Most of them actually have a little screw somewhere to uh, empty the last mm -hmm. little bit out of the little carburetor bulb on yep. the bottom. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, like, otherwise it's just not gonna work. Making sure that you use stabilizer in the gas, uh, you know, as a Over last ditch. Over winter and the, uh, even, yeah. even for storage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, doing whatever you can, changing the oil. So if you're gonna buy a generator, it will only work as good as you maintain it. And that's kind of why I've never really been big on recommending people buy generators. Yeah. Is because they, they only work if you care for them and most people don't have any reason to care for them. I, I, would, uh, I would offer a, an alternative type of generator uh, than just uh, gas and carbureted and things like that. Some of these propane power generators mm. are really good these days. And propane is nice because it's a pressurized gas. So, Clearing it out, uh, I mean, you don't have to worry about this fuel tank full of fuel sitting there all, you know, for years or over the winter or what have you. You can uh, hook up, hook one up to your five gallon propane tank or what have you, run it when you need to. There's no residual gas in a tank sitting inside your generator. I would imagine that that's probably a little uh, easier to maintain. I'm, I want to research that now because yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. That's a good point. A pro, and everybody's got a barbecue grill and five yeah. gallon tank and a propane tank. There, you can go get five gallons over the gas station for twenty bucks. You know, so. Yeah. yeah so I got a whole house generator, and uh, it actually runs off natural gas. Yeah. And so you know, like. You don't have to fill it with gas, but it probably doesn't have the same problems. Yeah. 
And yeah. it also, this one like starts itself every uh, week and has a little light on it, red or green, if, yeah. it, if it was able to start. <laughs> uh, so uh, every week I have a pulse on whether or not this thing is actually going to work when I need it because it runs for 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but it requires, it's an engine, it requires oil changes like everything else. I think I'll, I think I might, uh, actually I need a propane generator. I need a generator myself just to have at my house. But uh, I think I'm going to look into a propane one because I, I saw that yesterday in some of the comments after yesterday's video. Video, and they oh, were really? like propane tanks, propane uh, generators. Oh yeah, good idea. You know, <laughs> you learn something new every day. Uh, all right, so uh, we also hard lesson is computer backups are mm. not as valuable as people suggest. Big, uh, we did like I, I did a three part or maybe four part investigate series, and you know we talked about uh, you brought a you brought up that you were at the store. Somebody had told you. Uh, to know you're getting the best uh, battery backup or UPS battery backup had to be the heaviest. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we went into. I went over to Micro Center and I got, you know, a few like-sized uh, UPS battery backups, some smaller versions and did the test. And then to the biggest, heaviest ones I could get and did the test. And basically uh, we found that when you plug your power head into one of these battery backups, specifically like DC power head, uh, because the, the UPS battery backup is uh, converting the AC power to DC power back to AC power. You find that it ends up being uh, super inefficient and even like a $200, $250 bat UPS battery backup winds up only lasting you about five to six hours. Yeah, and somebody, I saw, I saw a comment in there and it kind of reiterates some of the things we've said in the past, which is a UPS battery backup for your computer is designed to provide somewhere between 500 and like 1500 watts of power yep. uh, during a power outage to give you enough time to turn the thing off. And boot, you know? boot it down and save like, and all that other minutes. stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, what we're looking for is not 1500 watts, but like, you know, in many cases, 15. Yeah. For as long as possible. And so the inverter, uh, the size of inverter that you're going to put on something that is going to drive 1500 watts just sucks up a lot more power than something that, like 15. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. We found that you get a matter of hours out of it, but like it's not a bad move, but also, mm. I, I don't know. You can actually get a, a, a decent power head with a battery bucket backup solution and skip the $150 bad solution. So that's why I think where, that it's only six hours today. A year from now it's going to be four and two years from now it's going to be two. Oh yeah, you keep them plugged in all the time and on the ready, eventually it's diminishing returns. And that's why you have to replace your UPS every so often. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like people said that a lot for a long time. And I guess if you happen to have one around, it's not a terrible idea, but the the options where you have these DC pumps now, like the Gyre and the Vortex and the Tunes is the Tunes one's cool because you can actually go buy your own battery mm -hmm. in whatever size you want. Yeah. Uh, but like those types of things, you, you know what I would really like and I, I would be really awesome is if somebody would make a battery backup for that accepts like my Dewalt battery for oh, my, my cordless that. drill and That's stuff like cool. that. Because I got cordless drills all the time. So if you can make one that's actually charging my drill thing and it just happens to, if the power goes out, it power my pumps. <laughs> but I can pull this thing off and go, you know, drill for a little bit that's and go put it back. Big, it's just a lithium ion battery. Yeah. Because yeah, that lithium, it's actually pretty expensive, the battery, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And it could run my tanks. <laughs> and the reason I got that idea actually is because our picking solution out back. Oh, yeah, they use uh, Dewalt batteries. They use Dewalt batteries because it's no, it doesn't make any sense for the the fast fetch people that design picking software to become battery engineers. Right, right, right. You can just go buy these things at Home Depot, <laughs> and then when we run out, when they break, you just go to Home Depot, get some more, and they have charges like a whole wall of these chargers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that'd be really cool. I think at a uh, you know at a bare minimum when we're talking about you know pr you know protecting the tank when it comes to a battery or a, a, an outage and whatnot, I would, uh, I would probably have a, you know, I'd, at a time like, you know, Black Friday or whatever, I'd probably buy, you know, a Tunes pump. Uh, and 
cheap or one of the cheaper ones or whatever it takes. So anything with flow and that, that battery uh, that battery one so I can choose my own battery. I've got those little batteries with the tune safety switch connector or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've got a bunch of those little things. I have little uh, ammo can uh, charge boxes that I build. I have you know, ice fishing gear that runs on those little batteries. Uh, good thing to just kind of keep around the tank in case the power goes out if I don't have a full battery backup solution for my tank. Another hard lesson, I actually had a fire. Uh, and so I had bought a used system that had uh, halides and T5s in it, right? Mm -hmm. And I plugged it all in, everything looked like it was running just fine, and uh, I was pleased with it. Uh, we're leaving the front door, I go to close the door and I'm like, hmm, kind of smells like smoke, man. Yeah. And like, I mean, it was like half a second from closing that door and then I would have come back to no home, oh, you know? Wow. Uh, and so we went back in and what I found was the used system I bought, the retrofit T5s were corroded uh, and shorting out uh, and creating a smoldering fire. Uh, and so like, that is one thing I would say, look for the, like those retrofit T5 things that are, are like, I don't know, they're not the safest things in the universe. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, just think about specifically on used systems, especially if it's all put together and you never, you didn't have to rebuild it yourself, which mm -hmm. means you didn't actually touch and see every part. You know, um, actually be around for that day first off, but like think about some of that stuff. Cause I actually almost burned down my house just by turning it on and it was that close. <laughs> Uh, another hard lesson to learn about wiring your reef tank and what you forgot. Too many things into one single power bar or power strip or any one of those things. Like, you know, you go by your strip uh, like this, uh, one of those long skinny ones, and you jam everything. It's got like five or six outlets and you try to jam everything into one of those little plugs. Um, yeah, that, unsafe. And actually, I, I've popped so many. Of, I've popped many of those before, trying to do that same thing. And not only that, but sometimes you get the uh, you know like your tunes oscillator uh, plug-in has a little roundiness to it, and so you got to jam that in there, and then you kind of got to bend it a little bit to get the next plug to fit. And you're just now you're exposing prongs, and I've done all of that before. And in hindsight, way unsafe. So there's some things in this series you're gonna hear us say more than once because they fit in different places, but when I feel the need to say them again, it's because that's the level of importance, right? Yeah. And here is one. Uh, a hard lesson. Uh, I guess I haven't read, had this one hard, but I don't want to, and I don't yeah. want you to have it either, which is if you have a power bar or an EB832 or a controller outlet or anything, if you have them sitting on the ground with the cords coming out of them, mm -hmm. not for a single minute, not for another hour, go fix that today. Because it is going to be a problem for you someday and it could be catastrophic. So if you have a power bar sitting on the ground with cords, little freeways of water going down into it, just go get the two screws and mount it to the side of the stand today. Yeah. Uh, and you'll never know the thing that you saved uh, here, but you'll, it'll be the problem that you never had that you're so happy you never had. Right in the razor's edge. All right, so what's next? All right, so uh, we're talking about episode seven here that's titled, how to produce the best water possible. This one's all about RODI. This is what you went and got certified for. This is what all of our CS team has books on their desk talking about water. This is our bread and butter right here and our core belief. Our core belief here, uh, this is the thing that all water will lead into. And it's not just RODI actually. There's a yeah, bunch of different yeah. things actually that feed into it. Chemistry, all that. All right. The core belief on, on how to make the best water possible. We are not maintaining a reef tank. We are maintaining water. And a reef tank is just the result of doing that well. Happy byproduct. Yeah, I like to say these things twice because they're so important. This is the core belief here that everything feels into. If you're like, oh, I don't believe that, this isn't the video for you. If it <laughs> is uh, something you believe, this is the one. We're not maintaining a reef tank. We're maintaining water and a reef tank is just the result of maintaining the water well. Right? Yes, absolutely. All right, so 
a lot of what, Randy Holmes Farley mentorship in this in this section here. There's so many things actually, yeah, that lead into this one. Mm. So what uh, what do we believe matter uh, matters most? Number one. Uh, number one, what we believe matters most: uh, how to produce the best water possible, eliminate the unknowns, and you know. Let's just, let's talk before the water even hits our, our tank here. We're talking now uh, water out of the tap. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I know I can go get my public water report and I can read about all of the things in there. And a lot of them have you know, elements and names and byproducts and all this stuff that I can't even pronounce. Pronounce that I don't even know. You know the difference between uh, this type of ion of, of one element versus a different type of ion and how that uh, you know how that changes the water chemistry and all that. Uh, if you if you want to save some headache and, and heartache and you know just frustration and headaches, uh, get your, uh, eliminate the unknowns. One of the ways to do that is uh, like a seven stage. You know, we we developed that the we investigated the uh, the different uh, resins, the uh, cation, the anion, and separating them. And what do you have when you connect, uh, connect them together? What do you have when you have like a third versus two thirds of one or the other? And how effective is, is it at removing you know, different contaminants? And uh, chloramines and the whole carbon block conversation uh, has led us to like a seven stage where you can just eliminate the unknowns. So the question becomes all the time is like, well, why are you pulling all the calcium and alkalinity and magnesium out of the water only to put it back in? Mm. And we're not doing that. What we're doing is we're stripping out everything, yeah. right? We're like starting fresh, zero TDS Pristine. water, stripping out all the contaminants, the pollutants, everything. Because the reality is, is you don't know what's in your water. And we do, uh, we've sent our water out for uh, ICP testing. Uh, and like at my house, I know that my water's got arsenic in it. Yep. I know that my water's got tons of silica in it. I know my water's got ammonia in it. I know my water's got copper in it. I know like all kinds of things. And so, you know, like there's kind of this false sensehood to like a sense of uh, uh, that like, if I could drink it, it must be okay for my fish too, which is absolutely not. I drink <laughs> chlorine, uh, and is it bad for me? Uh, yeah, but it's better than the black plague. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but the fish will kill immediately. So mm. there's these things are really sensitive creatures, and one of the reasons uh, the corals and the fish are different than us is we have organs that are designed to remove these things. Filter your liver, out, you yeah. know, your kidneys, all these things are designed to remove impurities out of your blood and your body. Like a coral doesn't have that. Yeah. You know, it's too much copper, it just dies. <laughs> you know, and so uh, that is why we go to RODI water. That's why is because you don't know. And even, even if you did know what's in your water, you don't know what's harmful in your water. Mm -hmm. And chasing that down it's just like i don't and, and they change all the time oh yeah you, you know you read a one water report one year from your municipality and the next year if you went to go you're, you can't trust that the information you saw last year in last year's report is the same this year because not only uh, do they change like uh you know not, not only do they change some of those disinfectants and different things that they put in the water but also the uh the usda or whoever controls you know uh, what is acceptable levels of different elements those change as well. Well, now we're not starting to see that this is more of an acceptable level, uh, or we can actually increase this level. I can tell you locally a couple of things that like people don't know, but like a lot of times what will happen is during por portion of the year they will actually just use chlorine. And another portion of the year, they'll add ammonia into the water intentionally to create uh, chloramines, and that ammonia will end up in your tank. Uh, and at other points of time, like in a drought or whatever, like the city here uh, will doesn't have enough water, they buy water from a neighboring city. And so what was river water a minute ago is now well water down the street, you know? Like, so... It's just not wise, man. Mm. That's why we use our ODI water here. That's why you strip it all out uh, and bring it back. Now, the seven stage, like 99%, not 90, but 90% of people would be okay with actually just a four stage. But, like, once you start getting into really, like, oh, man, there are these weird anomalies of ammonia gas. There's weird different pHs yeah. that also affect the different, yeah, I mean, ammonium versus ammonia versus ammonia gas. Yeah, like so, it's just peace of mind in the end. Well, I, I, another point to eliminating the unknowns is once you, you know, if you can eliminate that 
your water source for what you're uh, providing your tank or making your salt water out of is if you can elim if you can eliminate that all the unknowns uh, all of the variables for if your tank was going down if something was happening to your tank and you can say with peace of mind that I have my water filtration you know locked in it cannot be that uh, and we'll, you'll hear the same thing when we talk about lighting. Like, I have my lighting solution locked in. It cannot be that. The tracking down what's going on in your tank when you eliminate these unknowns because they're no longer unknowns. You don't you don't have to worry about them anymore. You already solved for them. Makes uh, problem solving on your tank way easier. Uh, the next one here uh, we already just said, but uh, what's good enough for humans is toxic to fish to coral. So don't don't think food grade or any of that stuff really yeah. uh, is uh, actually 100% the same because right off the bat, I'll tell you, a human can drink uh, disinfectant like chlorine. We can drink um, uh, the amount of ammonia that they intentionally put in there. We can put a drink uh, copper from our copper pipes that they get in there as a contaminant. Just levels of lead All these things that would immediately kill, like so toxic, it would kill it the second that you put it in there. Yeah. Uh, and so, and then there's all these things that are just going to stress it out and reduce its overall health. That's why we strip it all out. <laughs> uh, uh, that into the piece that you just said, and then what we believe most, RODI water is absolutely safe. You'll never wonder. Yeah. You'll never wonder, like, is well water good enough, whatever. It's always in the back of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Do I need to go get distilled, or can I use this, or that? Just. If you want to stop that question, RODI water. This one, actually, the next one is interesting because I bet you half of the people that are watching right now don't know this. Mm. What we believe matters most when it comes to water purity and how to produce the best water possible, one of them is that DI purges one TDS, and, or DI purges, and one TDS is not one TDS. Now, I don't know, um, I've her, seen the question asked a lot of times on the forums, on the Facebook groups, on our Facebook group. Uh, when do you guys, and it's a kind of a general question, when do you guys change out your DI resin? I, I still see so many answers that go, I change it out when it starts to read TDS. Okay, so you need to change it out before that. It has, you have to. Okay, so the reason for this is, like, and that's what I was told too in the beginning is, you know, you want to get every last bit of use out of the yeah. things that you have, right? And you're not trying to sell you a whole bunch of DI resin saying change it out prematurely. No, this, there's bad it's stuff that sliver, happens. It's a sliver, man. Like, it's not going to make any difference it's, to anybody uh, whether or not you change it out with an yeah. extra half inch of resin, right? So this is the reason why. The way that DI resin works is one bead's filled with hydrogen and the other one's filled with hydroxide. When you mix them together, they form water, H2O, mm -hmm. right? And they both have a positive and negative bead uh, on there and they pull out different contaminants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and it happens to kind of like create a layer cake and it just happens to pull out the things that it has the strongest affinity for. Yep. And what will happen is it kind of trades the ions until it has the strongest affinity for the thing at the top or the loosest, actually the loosest at the top. And the number one is ammonia, uh, it has the loosest affinity. So it won't be just one parts per million of random ass stuff Could that's be, in your yeah. water. No, this is a band of ammonia. ammonia. So once it starts going, it's just going to appear just purge pure, pure ammonia. All of it. And the one right after that is pure uh, uh, silica. Yeah. Right. And so. What you want to do is usually, well, you definitely don't want to use it if it says one. If it says zero, anything other than zero is done. But really what you want to use is you get a 10 inch cartridge. It's color changing. Color changing, man, like change when you got like a half inch left. Yeah, and right? when, the, when the band at the top is still dark blue and it's about a quarter of an inch or a half an inch, just change it. Or if you use two, just swap it out. Like, yeah. oh, I'm getting kind of close. I'll just kind of pull the yeah. one over. And that's probably the safest way to run it is, yeah, you know, you, you might only have one stage of DI and you have to catch this thing before it's a, a half of an inch of color change. But if you have a second stage, just follow, just kind of going through as a, as a polishing stage or a secondary stage, I'm less concerned about, I don't have to be there. I, I, this might actually change over completely, but I do still have a backup like protecting my water from this ammonia garbage puke. The Pro Series of the three resins kind of does that too, mm -hmm. but if if you that if that if that way if you had to, you can actually use the one all the way and will like kind of purge. And I guess the risk is you're just kind of purging ammonia over and over again as you swap these things out. Yeah. But uh, you could use the whole thing over. But the more most important piece here 
is anybody that tells you you should get to one TDS or two few TDS and then you, and use it, stop listening to that person because uh, absolutely it's a terrible advice. <laughs> uh, uh, you should make sure to change it. Never use anything over zero because that last few TDS is the worst stuff in your water, in many cases, the most toxic. And we'll puke it all out. <laughs> uh, we also believe that matters most, and another one, a lot of this stuff comes from investigating and investigating tests that we do. And this one uh, was one of those pressure matters, and pressure matters more than you think. You think, uh, uh, I mean, you see on the the uh, reverse of the RO membranes, you know, it's uh, 75 psi or 50, or 50 psi. You'll get uh, you know 75 gallons per day. Uh, you'll get a 98% uh, rejection rate. Uh, and true, yeah. But when you increase the pressure, you have more effective filter. You're actually uh, increasing the uh, efficiency of the filter too. Yeah. So most most of them suggest about 50 psi is like. If I had 50 PSI, I would get the 75 gallons a day out of it, and I'd probably get the rejection. But it doesn't account for is really cold water. Yep. And about 35 PSI is where the thing just like stops working in any, any reasonable manner. Yeah. It will start. It'll go slower and slower, and then all of a sudden it's just like got. It doesn't. Know, there's no product water reduction. <laughs> you know, it's terrible. Yeah. But also, even at 35, if you have really cold water, it's really like an effective 25. Right? Yeah. They test those uh, membranes at like 70, 70 degrees or 75 degrees. Yeah, most people do not have. 70 degree tap water. No, no. Yeah. Okay, and so here's one of my pet peeves actually, is you see like uh, a lot of the manufacturers out there like game the system, they'll like call it a 90 a gallon. A 90 gallon per yeah. day. And what they'll do then is say behind the scenes, uh, 90 at 65 PSI, which almost none of you have. Right. Uh, like less than probably 5% of you have 65 PSI at, at the tap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's total false marketing. Like it, makes, It's a 75 gallon per day membrane, but the, it's marketed as a 90 gallon per day membrane. It's the exact same it's membrane. It's the exact same membrane, 75, but they're, if they're at, just talking instead of 50 pressure. at 65, mm -hmm. it's just garbage, marketing garbage. And so, I don't know, trust that person the way that you should because they're willing to trick you up front. But pressure does matter. And we've seen, uh, we've seen water production up to uh, not 75 gallons per day, but as you climb the scale of pressure, 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 PSI, you know, with a booster pump, you start to see, you know, 75 gallons per day, uh, you know, 80 gallons per day, 100 gallons per day, 110 gallons per day. You actually make, you make more water by increasing your pressure uh, and you're doing it more effectively. I'm pretty certain, uh, you, you have, there's an investigation you can go watch on yep. pressure, so just search RODI and pressure if you want to know this, but I think, as I recall it, if you got up to about 90 PSI, which mm -hmm. is about the limits of what most of these yeah. uh, canisters and stuff should hold, uh, I think you hit like 150 gallons an hour, or a day. Yeah. Right, you can double the output and uh, use up less DI because it actually functions better. Mm. So pressure, pressure definitely matters. matters. Uh, another thing that I believe matters most is understanding that mixed bed DI resin, the resin that almost everybody uses, yeah. is super wasteful. It very much wasteful. Another another investigates experiment. So in the mixed bed, the standard blue mixed bed that you get, we've used for years, I've used for years before we found the anion, cation, and uh, cation mixed. Uh, in the mixed bed, in your standard mixed bed, you have almost, is it 50-50 anion cation mix? 60-40 Yeah, many. somewhere in there. But uh, so you have anion, uh, which om almost always, like 98 per 99 percent of the time, is the first one to get exhausted. And then you've got the cation resin in there, which uh, doesn't, is not even nearly exhausted as fast. And then pulling out different things from the or charges from the water, but... There's two things that play into that. Yeah. One, the water supplies often have a lot of CO2 in them, uh, and the CO2 will just chew through the, the, the anion. anion. Yeah. So again, there's two beads in there, and all of a sudden it just chews through one of them, and then after that, the TDS will go up and you'll have to yeah. swap it out. The second piece of it is the cation resin actually lasts about, twi has twice the capacity as, the as well. And usually it's 60-40, meaning 60% of this, more of this one. And so the net result of this is you're watching actually the, the anion ch change, change color, change color mm -hmm. and that's what you're watching go up. And you'll burn through all the anion resin, but the reality is you may have actually only used maybe 10% of the capacity of the cation resin. But now you have to change it out because it's mixed bed and your anion's done and you're getting TDS. So here I am dumping and replacing a mixed bed uh, canister that has perfectly good cation resin still in it. 
Okay, so this, if you use a, a, a DI resin canister like once every six months, uh, forget this message, doesn't, yeah. that doesn't apply to yeah, you. Yeah. If you're burning through a canister of DI resin like once a month, this matters to you. Go get all three. Get a standard uh, cation resin, anion resin, and then a mixed bed polish on the end. And what you'll find is you only really ever have to change the is anion. the anion one, like maybe 10 to one or five to one. Yeah. And it'll like, it, it'll vary, but you'll find out like this stuff lasts way longer and it's way cheaper this way. And you're only changing out the anion resin. So you're not throwing away unused resin. It's one, one for one. So, and the byproduct of this is actually too, like what happens is the pH in each one of these things skyrockets. Like mixed bed resin naturally produces a seven neutral pH, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there's a lot of contaminants that are actually hard to remove at a natural, uh, a seven pH. So what will happen is it'll go into one of them, it'll skyrocket uh, the pH, which will change the form of many of the contaminants into something that is removable. And then it'll go into the next one and it'll like drop the pH through the floor, mm -hmm. which will also change it uh, into something that, a different form that uh, the resin can pr remove that into a, a type of contaminant as a charge. Yep. And then it goes into the mixed bed for a uh, final polish. So the, the three different like kind of pro series, it's a more intelligent, it is less wasteful, and it will remove more contaminants. And one of the biggest ones is actually the ammonia gas. They mm -hmm. can, ammonia gas will go right through the membrane because yep. it's a small molecule, just goes right through the membrane. Also doesn't have a, an electrical charge, so it'll go through the right DI. through the DI in many cases. Uh, but if we change the form uh, of the ammonia, it'll turn into ammonium, which has a charge and, can and be pulled out. the resin will remove. Mm. So uh, especially in a world where like probably 50% of you have chloramines, which is ammonia in the more water, and when it splits from the, uh, the chlorine, chlorine a lot of times will turn into ammonia gas. If it's a high pH, it will turn into ammonia gas. Yeah. Mm. So like here we have a pH of 10 in our water-ish. Yes. Uh, which means all of it almost turns into ammonia gas. Mm. Uh, all right, the next one. This one actually is pretty interesting. Oh is, yeah, we kind of hit that one too. Uh, all, what, <laughs> I don't know if this matters most, it's, but it's helpful to know actually. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've been to all the shows and you know shopped for all of the membrane stuff. Almost all of the RO membranes that you buy come from the exact same place. <laughs> Dow. Dow. Doesn't matter what the Dow sticker film is on it. It could be Dow made, rebranded for a different brand, but it's basically Dow. Yeah, and like even the ones that, like there's two things that will happen, or three things. There, there, there is some chunk of some off-brand stuff, but Dow makes the best membranes, everybody admits it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So when you go to the water trade shows, Dow, it'll be one of three things. You just buy the damn Dow thing. Or uh, you can buy Dow material and they roll it themselves. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> or they just put a different sticker on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A and the reason for that is generally when they want to change it from Dow into uh, a rebranded rolled one, it's only because they want to charge more for it. Right. Because yeah. the Dow we ones are like commodity now. We make, we make our own so we can charge more. You put a sticker on it it's and like Dow. call it double, triple check to super deluxe or whatever, <laughs> uh, whatever. It, all of a sudden you can charge $30 or $50 more for it. Uh, well, they're all coming from the same place. Still a Dow. Uh, the only difference, uh, you know, meaning, so, you know, with that in mind, if you go back to what we just said, you know, because you see one called 75 gallons per day and because you see one called 90 gallons per day, those are the two same membranes. The exact same. Exact same thing. No difference. Yeah. Just yeah. how much you pressurize. Uh, what's not the same <laughs> yeah, and what we believe matters most, carbon blocks are not created equal. They are not the same. Uh, and we have CTO carbon blocks, matrix carbon blocks, chlor even chloramine specific carbon blocks. Uh, and then the BRS Universal is kind of out of all of the investigating and you know, all the research that you did, and uh, out of the other side came a BRS Universal carbon blocks. Uh, one, for the reason that more and more and more and more and more municipalities at the time are switching over to chloramines, and the uh, Universal one, be I mean, you look at it side by side, it's triple the thickness of a standard carbon block. You could hold it, it weighs yeah. twice as much. It's made. Uh, you know, these will attack, well, it can actually pull out the, the chloramines, can then break up that chlor chlorine and ammonia bond better and last longer than a standard carbon block. 
Okay, so carbon blocks can be made out of anything. It can be made out of coconut, coal, yep. all yep. kinds of different stuff. And it, so it's not like one manufacturer of a membrane in the world. They're all different, right? Uh, and one of my biggest pet fee peeves, and one of maybe the most destructive things I've seen the community share is uh, uh, it doesn't really matter, chloramines, yeah. whatever, without testing it or knowing it. And the only threshold is, well, I didn't kill my tank. Yeah. Uh, well, you don't even know. You don't know the problems you may or may not have had. But the reality is, is we've done the experiments here. We used a we ten thousand dollar Hawk <coughs> machine to we monitor buy, it. Yeah, massive equipment. Yeah. Okay, like the normal carbon block on chloramine specifically would last like three hundred gallons, where the other one would last like seven thousand gallons. Okay, and 300 gallons doesn't even include the uh, wastewater ratio, uh, which means that you're you're gonna like every 70 gallons you're gonna have to throw your carbon block out, and, like every water change, man. Every once a month you're gonna buy a new carbon block. Well, and that's uh, you, when you think about it too. You, you know, a lot of people complain about my, my DI resin. My DI resin just burns too fast. My DI resin turns burns mm. too fast. Uh, I would go look at your carbon blocks and the chloramines in there because very well, like once that thing is spent. Ammonias, chlorines, getting through the carbon block. Potentially, it depends on yeah. pH and stuff and how that would work. But you know, here's the thing: is uh, that is the most destructive thing out there. So I, I will just tell you, we've tested so many so of them, many. and you know, it's funny. Actually, we <laughs> just put this together. Uh, normally, with the membranes, they would put a new label on it to make it more expensive. Yeah. So in our case, we actually went the other direction. We, we put we, our own label on a carbon block. Yeah. So the, I mean, we don't make carbon blocks here. We no. went to the best. We tested all of them. We went to the best ones. Uh, and then when I bought them, they're like, "Yeah, well, these are map price, and they have to be twenty-six dollars each." And I'm like. Well, what if I put my own label on it and then I buy 40 foot container loads full of them? <laughs> Can we charge whatever you want? Yep. Well, now they're 17 bucks. 17 bucks. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the other direction is. Actually, it's pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, the carbon block, uh, the big the things, if it, if it weighs more, it's probably got more carbon yeah. in it. If you look through the center of it and there's yeah. a big hole the size yeah. of a silver dollar, it's probably got less carbon in it than the one that's got a hole the size of a pencil. You know, this uh, goes back to the one of the first ones that we shared of what believes matters most. And, you know, just getting the right carbon block and understanding that not they're not all the same or they're not all created equal and they don't all work to, to the same efficiency. Eliminate the unknowns. Just get get the better carbon get the rock. Right one. Mm. Uh, especially because it works in all the, the yeah. disinfectants. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. Next one. So I told you it wasn't all about RDI. It's not all about RDI. Yeah. We're getting into water chemistry. All right. So uh, what we believe matters most here. Whew. Salt mix. If you can see the impurities with the naked eye, I'd pass. <laughs> Uh, a lot of salt testing happened in, uh, like two years ago, I think I did a whole, just an exhaustive investigates on salt testing and, uh, settling cones as one of the, was one of the big visual indicators is when you mix up, you know, some salts or you, uh, not even settling cones, but you even look around the forums and you see like, uh, people have in their salt mix station, just brown crud. And like, I just cleaned this thing. Uh, this is a white container. I just mixed up a massive batch to 1.026. I had it sit there mixing for a, you know a day or so, and I come back, and there's just brown gunk. My my white container is now brown. Uh, there's actual physical chunks down in the bottom of the thing. Uh, if you can see the impurities with your naked eye, I'd pass. Hard pass. Okay, so here's the piece, man. Historically, and the answer is like people kind of like grasp on a, a plausible theory and just kind of like spread it around, mm -hmm. right? So the plausible theory was that uh, the all that brown garbage in the mixing bin that you get out of it is actually like a, like some kind of precipitate or something, mm. right? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you though, we mixed up a bunch of salts of, of similar types of uh, calcium and alkalinity magnesium levels that mix up crystal clear, uh, Tropic Marin being one of them, uh, and doesn't have that crud. So why is that one not precipitating all this brown crud out? Mm. And this is what I like. This is what I wholeheartedly believe. Uh, if somebody who trusts me wanted an answer out of me and I would tell you that what I believe to be true, it's that the sodium chloride is the number one source of Con contaminants. contaminants in there, your source Impurities. of sodium chloride. Uh, 
And so like Tropic Marin is using pharmaceutical grade, which has a standard, is left to that standard, it's inspected, it, the facility has to meet that standard. Yeah. Uh, it produces a different result than what a lot of times they're doing is kind of testing batches, they're finding veins that are generally mm -hmm. pure enough when they're mining it out of the ground. But like when you mine some of the ground, man, it like, or even, you know, dehydrate the ocean, you know, to create these, uh, you know, salt ponds. Yeah. It, it has impurities in it. I think the, that's the, what LeBron gunk is. Why this one is, this one seems so hard for the community or, or uh, you know, Non uh, for disbelievers to follow is that uh, uh, all, all the salt mixes work. Like we've all had success on on the salt mixes. Yes, but we're actually going to hit on one reason why that isn't true in a second. But yeah. yes, I'll let you finish. Uh, but you know, if it's not making my fish jump out of the water the minute that I do a water change, then I don't. I'm not connecting this uh, long term consequences if there are any. You know those weird, you know, mishaps on why corals die when everything was doing good. What, what can I tie that to? Uh, it's hard to draw that parallel between, maybe it's the impurities building up in my tank from the salt that I've been using. So I don't want to get hung up on one brand over another one. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, like all these brands, people use to different degrees, you know, like so like one brand's not bad over another one. Right, right, right. Because like what that is all about is just like brand loyalty. If yeah. you talk about the brand. But if I actually just walked you up and I showed you one that is crystal just clear bins. and yeah. one of them is full of brown crap and I asked you which one you want to put in your tank, 100%, 100 reefers out of 100 reefers would say, I want the crystal clear one. No labels, no right. brands, no nothing. Okay. Then when I attach the price to it and one of them is 100 bucks and one of them is 60 bucks, well, there's a different uh, question now, I'll right? Pay, I'll pay for the crystal, crystal clear. Okay, some people might just actually pick the $60 one, right? But then when I tell you, hey, do the math on the water change here and how you're gonna actually use this salt, uh, and then think about what's actually in your tank here, and that one is gonna cost $4 a month more. So forget about the 60. The, the upfront uh, cost, the yeah, sticker shop. This one's gonna cost $5 more uh, a, a month. month. A crystal clear. Never mind. <laughs> you know, I went back. If you actually have to process the statement, I mean, it's forty dollars different right now, but it's five dollars a month the way you use it. Okay. Uh, okay. So in that spirit, uh, uh, I'll share a couple of things. What I believe matters most is there is a difference between a marketing claim of we're the best, uh, our stuff is pure, mm. uh, and a graded material. Yeah. And the raise, also the graded material isn't just graded uh, to remove many things. The process of removing all of those things removes a lot of other things along with mm -hmm. it that are undesirable. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's not a it's not a grade for that's designed for the saltwater hobby. We're talking like when you're talking pharmaceutical grade com chemicals and components, this is a grade that applies to the all the industries or the majority of the industries that these chemicals are used in. So you know the baby formulas, the salts, the human consumption, the different things like that. Uh, a lot of those grades and standards hold true not just for saltwater and salt mix, but anything that the chemical is being used for. All right, so I'm gonna jump, actually we're gonna skip one, come back to it, but I'm gonna jump okay. down to one of the hard lessons here. Okay. Uh, okay, so when we talk about ungraded salt, right, and like we're just kind of buying tech grade off the market sodium chloride, mm -hmm. and then we know full well it's dirty because it's brown. I can see it. Yeah, I can see it with a naked eye, man. I don't need a test kit to tell me. Yeah. Right, okay. And then the thought process, though, is a, uh, well, the brown stuff isn't killing my tank. I, I don't know if it's healthy, but it, it isn't killing everything immediately. Here is the piece that, like, I really think is an evolutionary thought process for everyone to consider. Because mm. there are all kinds of what I would call uh, cluster tank crashes, mm. right? You see it probably once a year, if uh, definitely every other year, but once a year where like all of a sudden some reef club or something will order you know multiple pallets of a salt from somewhere uh, at a special deal or something and all of a sudden like 50 tanks crash all in that one area mm. right uh why is it and sometimes it'll be there was like a bad batch in times of like the alkalinity was off the charts or too low or whatever but 
Uh, in most cases, you can fix that. Mm. But in many cases, it's unexplainable. Like, you know, what, what was it about that salt that all of a sudden killed 50 tanks in California all at once? Mm. You know, what was it about the, you know, there's very public tanks that all they did is like a water change and all of a sudden everything went really bad, you know, and maybe it was bad just timing. But also, maybe it's just, you know, the generally pure vein of sodium chloride that is ungraded, it has no standards, and nobody's checking on it. You hit a bad spot. Hit a bad spot. <laughs> you hit a polluted spot. And like, if, if we just write that off as impossible, not true. Yeah. On a long enough timeline, is there mining, you know, sodium chloride out of the ground or dehydrating it out of the ocean? All kinds of stuff can happen. Mm. So that is why that five bucks for a water change of getting something that you know is good. It's kind of like the, uh, the thing you said about the RO stuff. Yeah. Which is, I just don't have to ever worry that my salt mix is ever going to be the problem. Eliminate the unknowns. If you use graded material that is checked, uh, and not some ICP test after the fact. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. I'm talking about yeah. using the right materials to begin with. Yeah. When, if something were to happen to my tank, I can say, not my salt mix, because I, I purposely chose this one. Not my RO, not my RO water, source water, because I accounted for that too. Okay, so uh, also uh, in terms of what we believe matters most, this is actually really poignant because it, it depends on who you are and how you use your salt. Because mm -hmm. I use my salt differently than most people do. I don't know if most people, but many people do, which is some salts store better than others. A hundred percent, and yes. we can prove it and <laughs> because there's episodes out there that we did, uh, and maybe Adam or somebody can share, but yes, uh, some stores, salts store better than others. And we're talking not only from a uh, brown crud type, uh, you know, yeah. What we saw over two weeks of storage and four weeks worth of storage was some of those salts uh, that have, you know, claim high levels. So, you know, 12 DKH and, you know, 500 calcium or whatever it have may be. What you find is like after a short period of storage, I mean, 28 to 48 hours, uh, not only is there a precipitate building up on the walls in the, uh, of your tank or your storage tank, too. yeah, in the top, you can actually follow the downtrend of the alkalinity. You can follow the downtrend of the calcium. And then there's some salts out there that do not have, uh, you can either, and, and I, we tested it. I tested it both uh, just sitting in a vat of water, no heat, no circulation, S testing, uh, storing it with circulation only, storing it with heat and circulation only, and the, time and time again, these specific salts come out as they're not changing alkalinity levels. There's no change to calcium levels. There's no degradation to the uh, to those. There's no degradation like in far as precipitate on the walls. It just stores four weeks plus easy peasy. So if you're mixing up your salt uh, just to use it today, it really doesn't matter. Use no, whatever no, one you want. Moot point. Uh, if you're going to mix up a bat of salt and do 10% water changes for the next month or auto water changes, you mm. want something that stores for a month and isn't going to change chemistry the entire time. Yeah. Uh, and so we did a bunch of experiments on it and some of them actually do better than others. And like you'll see actually double bat in some cases where when you want to store it and uh, the calcium and alkalinity does drop and you actually get all this crust, like white crust and stuff yeah. all over and then you get the brown crud on top of it too. Yeah. And the nature of it is in, in an experiment, uh, experiment uh, environment where we've got really well lit glass boxes, we're using a little eye chart behind it, you can see clarity. You can see uh, uh, like all the brown gunk. If I got Contrast, a brute trash can in my basement, it's not a good, like, well, I don't know, it looks, it looks really clean. good, I guess. It maybe, looks like it's mixed. You know? Yeah. Uh, in spirit, uh, this one isn't written down here, also, too. That's, yeah. It's some of these salts absolutely mix up faster in a way that I wouldn't see in the bin mm -hmm. down there, but when I have it at, in an actual time-lapse experiment, you know, you can see that like the Tropic Marin uh, did it in a matter ESV of hours. ESV was um, almost immediate because it's all pre-done. Yep. Yeah, ESV, the, the fastest one, probably with ESV because you're mixing in the magnesium first, yep. right? And then you're not getting any of the precipitate at all, mm -hmm. or I shouldn't say that's a strong phrase, but like when you mix it up all the way together with the magnesium first, then add the sodium chloride and then add some of the other elements together the way that they're doing it, it mixes up the fastest for sure. Yeah. And you'd be surprised because uh, here, here I was when I was first mixing salt, uh, when I first started the hobby, uh, put it in a five gallon bucket, drop of uh, Marine Land or, or drop a, a little MJ pump in there 
And about 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, I don't see salt crystals. It's ready to go. Uh, none of the salts that we tested were done in one hour, two hours. Some approaching three hours. It was about that five hour mark where homogeneously you, you can see it's crystal clear. There's nothing left to be mixed. And then there's other salts that even after 24 hours, never did lose a cloudiness to it. Uh, it wasn't fully homogeneously like, mixed. Yeah, 20, 48 hours still is murky. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, another one, is, is anything that has like the amino acids and stuff in it too, or organics, which is kind of, uh, you know, maybe good for the an immediate water change. Not really great if you want to store it for a month. Mm. Yeah. Know? So uh, I would encourage you to watch that entire like playlist the of whole salt, salt testing. Like, playlist. It was just so good. So yeah, that's the nature of all this uh, stuff is coming not out of a belief structure, but after doing all of these experiments. Uh, yeah, I, I think that when you use these stuff, again, like if I gave it to you and I actually showed you how murky it was versus how crystal clear it was, what would you if it wasn't a brand name attached to it. Just two tanks. I'd pick the clear one every time. Every time. And the one that mix up faster, it, every time. It feels right. Uh, and, and so, Here's the piece, though, is like you'll hear that bit of advice or you know counsel from people like, well, I don't know, I mix it up for ten minutes and like I didn't kill everything. It hasn't hurt anything yet. Well, non-dissolved salt can't be good for gills. It can't be good for falling onto the coral sensitive tissue. Mm -hmm. Did, was it so toxic that it immediately killed them? No, no, nope, it wasn't. Apparently, doesn't mean that it's good. Because every one that I showed you, 100%, 100 uh, reefers out of 100 reefers, if I showed you in a well-lit environment, Blind test. crystal clear salt mix that had been mixed for six hours uh, and with a salt that's actually capable of mixing in six hours, versus one you mixed up for 10 minutes, Randy style, uh, and actually Ryan <laughs> style in the path too, is which one would you use? Zero would mix the, <laughs> Zero. The, the, the one that's cloudy. You just can't tell because it's in a dark you know, bin inside yeah. of a brute trash can. Yeah. Mm. All right. Strong stuff. I know. Uh. <laughs> Clearly, uh, that's what is going to my heart. <laughs> it, uh, there's so much misinformation on this one. It's just not widespread. It's, it's yeah. marketing. It's, you know. Brand like, affinity is probably the biggest culprit in the salt mix uh, you know, argument, the whole debate. It, absolutely, hundred percent. It, it didn't kill everything. Not good enough. My salt is the best because I bought it. That is a terrible argument. <laughs> <laughs> it is, man. If we're that being a, honest with ourselves, that, that's exactly what people are saying. When you say what salt mix is the best, and you see this bickering the argument going on, the only, the really, the only thing that's driving that is it's because uh, they may say because of the levels, because it mixes fast, because of all this other stuff. It's because it's the one you bought. Well, here's the thing. Mix as fast is just a perception until you actually test until it you actually against test other it. things. And then you're like, oh, wow, that didn't go the way I thought it did. Yeah. And you're like, it, really ask yourself for a moment right now. Hmm. If we took away the option that you use right now that you bought, it, like that one's no longer an option. Just and you, you can't said, buy it anymore. You said, what is the best salt out there? You might evaluate it based on the performance of that actual salt rather than a brand name. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and like grades of material is yeah. a legit thing to actually, and, and here's the thing, the reasons that those other uh, buckets don't have the graded material on it is because they want it to be as cheap as possible. Yeah, and, and I, a lot of people think that cheap is better. Yeah, well, okay, dude, it does, it meets that. So in that case, if cheap is the most important thing, and definitely, in my mind, Instant Ocean is the way to go. Yeah. Skip all the rest. It's like the cheapest or pick the best. One uh, or the other. Yeah. Every, every Skip all the things in the middle. <laughs> uh, 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 the ones in the middle are all just marketing. I think, uh, I think it'd be great to just post those types of polls every once in a while uh, on our social media and all the way through is, you know, this versus this and not tell you anything about them. And Which one of these would you use? Uh, that, and it's yeah. not just salt mix. There's a whole bunch of different things you could do it with, too. It's obvious. Uh, the answer is already mm. there. All right, so I hard lessons that we've learned. A lot of these hard lessons have come from <laughs> investigative tests that we've done in here. I mean, we've got a, a library of videos on BRS TV Investigates channel uh, approaching 2,000-some, if not over 2,000-some videos, a lot of them being uh, investigates. And so we learned a lot of hard lessons. Uh, one of the hard lessons uh, that we're just kind of coming off the heels of here is uh, dosing brown garbage to the tank. This is actually a specific experience for me. So back in my first house here in Crystal, mm -hmm. my first tank, I would, you know, 
I think I was using reef crystals at the time. Yeah, I'm pretty certain yeah, I yeah, was. Yeah. Uh, and so this tank, this bin, you know, is just building up brown gunk like crazy. Just been mixing. Right? And, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like, it's all over the bottom. It's all over the sides. It's everywhere, right? Yeah. And at one point in time, like the power head kind of falls off and like mixes it all up. It actually reincorporates all the brown gunk from all the other brown gunks from over the time into like concentrated brown gunk. Right? Okay, I'm embarrassed to say this, but <laughs> like, I'm like, well, I don't know, man. It can't be toxic, right? It's the stuff that came in with the salt, so I just used it, and it added brown gunk to the tank. That was stupid. Yeah. I, that was absolutely dumb. And and it was, you know what it was? It's, 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 it's that mindset of like, well, it must be safe. It's made for a salt reef tank, so whatever's in there must not be bad. I'm like. Nah, it's just not so bad that uh, the fish jump out. But if I make it that concentrated like that, mm. dumb, dumb move. Well, yeah. I mean, then dosing the brown. Uh, I guess the, the the moral of the story the, there is I the, should have just been cleaning the bin. So well, it's not that there. hard. I just in between use dump some water in there with some citric acid, and it'll clean it all out periodically uh, with a pump. And some I salt you have that. to do that more than others, uh, more frequently than others, and then it becomes a headache. And then are you actually, if it's not easy, are you actually going to do it? And we get into that whole conversation. Yeah. But the, you know, the dose in the brown gunk is something that I mean, you can we physically? Uh, we I mean, we'd have to set up a long-term test for this. But uh, can you? I wonder how many tank crashes or problems in a tank are as a result of the impurities of the stuff in your salt. And it's so hard to point to because there's so many variables in how a tank could crash. Uh, but I would not be surprised if even, even some, some of this stuff's like non-sol non-soluble and stuff. So this, it just sits there and maybe changes form over time and whatnot. So you couldn't, maybe you couldn't even test for it in an ICP test, uh, but it is in your, in your tank. But uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that this pops out to me, the dosing of the brown garbage to the tank, is the first time I ever saw Chad uh, hook up a gigantic 20-inch sediment filter on our water mixing station right here. And uh, we would run that as a pre-filter out to actually filling up the bins or uh, running the hose out to fill up a tank. And it was so surprising that after a 200 gallon bin, that sediment filter without, I mean, freshly, mi freshly mixed, brown, like deep, thick, nasty, sludgy, a sediment filter is completely clogged in brown. Okay, so I saw that same thing, right? And I was like, well, you know, you, so if you mix up a single bucket of some of these salts and uh, then send all of that water before you use it through a sediment filter, it will mm. remove a lot of that brown gunk. Yeah. And it'll be like slimy. There's so much of it yeah, actually yeah, on right, there right. once you remove it in this fashion. And all I could think of is once you see that, why would you ever want to use it? <laughs> you know? And, and then this is kind of the response, though, in this case, mm. is... Uh, well, because here we get broken buckets all the time. He's like, well, it's free, dude. I'm not going to let, let it go to waste. True, true. And I'm like, well, <coughs> gosh, man. If it was free, <coughs> if it was free, would I use it after seeing the single bucket fill that entire thing up with slime? That, you know, just the only reason, thick. The only reason I used it, even if I saw it, is because, uh, I mean, everybody uses it. There's a lot of people that use it. It's free. Uh, I can't throw away free salt, bro. But once you see it, man, <laughs> once you see it, like, oh, yeah, I don't know. I know. So even if it was free, yep. I don't know. Uh, so uh, one of the things, hard lessons here is, I think I already mentioned it, yep. clean your tubs. Yep. Uh, there's Such no reason acid. to let whatever that is build up. I will tell you after, it must have been at my own house, because uh, I'm going through a lot of, when it was 360 gallons, uh, I must have gone through 10 buckets of this stuff. And at the end of 10 buckets of Chalk Marin, the thing looked brand new. Yeah. So like, I, I don't have to clean it. Yeah. But if I was using something else, I would probably want to clean that thing probably every other month. I mean, fill it up with water, throw the citric acid, yeah. let it melt, clean it out, dump it all out. Something to think about, you know, to future proof your water mixing station. If you were going to build your water mixing station, have uh, plumb it in a way that allows you to do that. You'll plumb it, uh, get a drain down in the bottom of it or plumb it in a way where I can fill it up with water, mix citric acid in it, get all of that citric acid water out, rinse it and clean it and rinse it and clean it before I mix my next batch of RODI. I'm going to retract actually. I wouldn't do that. I would do uh, what Chad did. I would put it, if I was gonna use 
salt that was I knew full well was going to contaminate the bin that I was using. Mm. And it was going to get dirty, and I don't want it to like just build up forever. I would just get the 20 inch sediment filter, big the guys. big giant yeah. guy, mm -hmm. uh, and close loop it into the the bin that I was using, yeah. and just have it remove it. So the cleaning now is just swapping out the sediment filter. It isn't scrubbing out the inside of this bin and trying to fill it with water, empty it with water, yeah. citric acid, get the citric acid out. Uh, sediment filter, actually, thank you, Chad. I think I, <laughs> I think if, if I was gonna use that type of salt at this point, that's the way I would run it. 100%. Uh, you could also take that nasty brown, dirty salt uh, that was free and just use it on your driveway if you had to. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know if it works that way. I don't know if I would. Uh, hard lesson learned. Um, getting this kind of getting back to that DI stuff that we were talking about. And, and this is how to produce the best water ep uh, possible, episode seven of the 52 weeks. Hard lesson learned from, you know, for the last uh, decade or two decades, carbon blocks actually recharge. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Yeah, they basically, you'll use the carbon block until it stops working, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would think that you need to change it out, but actually, you if you rest, let it rest, rest it. it lasts a lot longer. And that was one of the things I found out when you when you look at these things and they say uh, it will last uh, twenty thousand gallons or whatever. That's based on normal use, like in a drinking water application. Where, where it's I, on, off. Yeah, on, I come off, up and I fill on, this cup. Off. Yeah. yeah. It's not our application where I'm using 75 like, gallons or in our ODI, 200 gallons to produce 75. Yeah. And it's been running for 24 hours. Yeah. It's rated on get producing a cup of water. Yeah. Uh, and so in a cup of water, it's constantly recharging. Yeah, its you can get 20,000 gallons out of it. Yeah. But then when we did our test, and you see that you only get like 300 gallons uh, of chloramine breakage before there's you know, that, that breakthrough, uh, well, that didn't give me anything for my salt water. You know, and, and another one in here is that, uh, it, like, when they say 20,000 gallons, read the fine print, because the fine print on a lot of them... Chlorine only? No, they, they say chlorine taste and smell removed 50%. Mm. So it will remove taste and smell of chlorine uh, to a 50% threshold of what the taste and smell was before. Like, what is that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so like with uh, the universals, it's, it's gonna remove 85% of the chlorine. Mm -hmm. uh, that is when the threshold of replaced it is. Yeah. And, and that's also why you usually use two, is because the carbon block, none, not a single carbon block is 100% efficient. No. It will always let something through, and that's why you have the second one that's to catch it. That's why we do two. Uh, all right. Ah, another reason why we use two also. For uh, chlorines, uh, chloramines create ammonia. And so again, I'm not gonna bore you with it. Chloramines, chlorine, ammonia bonded together, carbon block uh, neutralizes it. the chlorine. Ammonia gas goes off into your system. There you go. Uh, or it could be ammonium at a low pH. Mm. Uh, ammonia gas though will go right through the membrane. Uh, and that's another reason why you got to use a DI resin. Yeah. Uh, the DI resin sometimes will change the pH, just the, the mixed bed of the ammonia gas to replace it, uh, but definitely the three stages. Well, well. And there's some problem solvers that we, you know, that we didn't really hit on. The, I uh, seen some comments on was the uh, like the which part uh, like if silica is my problem, if uh, ammonia is my problem, if CO2 is my problem in my water. Uh, you know, how these different things go. There's some really in-depth DI resin videos that that guy did uh, a few years back that break down all of the chemistry behind all of those. Uh, worth checking out if you want to get smart about what's in your water. If you want to find out why, watch it. If you want to find out how, all of them, end of story, was anion re or cation resin, anion resin mixed bed is the solution to all of them. There you go. <laughs> uh, efficiency, removing everything, because it changes it all the forms. Yeah, silica uh, busters is really just a little yeah. bit of cation on an anion. And, and marketing. Uh, marketing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Charge a little bit extra. Uh, hard lessons learned in uh, producing the best water possible, assuming that a single water change is the same as 300. Yeah, so like when I'm using whatever I'm using, you know, for my salt mix or I'm adding anything to the salt, like, uh, this goes along with actually any chemistry or additive or anything. Mm -hmm. Like, if I put something in the tank and the fish didn't jump out dead, that's not the same thing as if I choose to do that same exact thing 300 times for 300 times over the course of five years. The bad decisions build up. Yeah. Now, water changes mm -hmm. is a goofy one in the essence that. 
you're not always going to build it up because you're actually taking some out to put some in. Mm -hmm. But what happens is a lot of organisms in the tank will like take the copper or whatever and build it up into its tissue and hold on to it. And so it may not actually be like elevating in the tank per se, it's just the higher levels of it is slowly becoming more and more toxic to the organisms mm. in the tank. So consider that, like that a single bad decision actually isn't the same as that same decision made 300 times. Yep. Uh, one of the things I wanted to hit on here with the chloramines and ammonia, if you ever walk up to your bin and you're like, hmm, smells this like kind of smells pee? like cat pee or ammonia, I've heard it a hundred times. It's because it does. It's because it, of that ammonia gas got through, right? Yep. That's the biggest reason to use DI resin after the RO probably. Yeah. Uh, I wish membrane. I had that answer when I was a customer service agent because we got calls on that all the time. It's like, your, your, your stuff isn't working. My stuff sm it smells like cat pee. And I'm like, well, no. Didn't know that it was ammonia gas that it gets through all of those because it doesn't have a charge. Yep, no ammonia. Uh, and so uh, in that case, if, it, if you think it smells like ammonia, it does fix your solution. Uh, and it might be add DI or it might be add the Pro Series series. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, we already did the cluster mm -hmm. thing. So, mm -hmm. all right, after that, after how to produce the best, wa best water possible, what's next? Uh, we are talking about episode eight of the 52 Weeks of Reefing. This one was called Tank Temp, finding a way to trust your heaters. So much of uh, learned uh, along the, over the years. Uh, so much so that we have, we've d adopted this core belief. All right, core belief, everything that we're gonna do leads up into this because this is our guiding light. Mm. The heater is going to die and your tank with it unless you choose a different path. Like, that was a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Your heater is going to die and your tank with it Unless you choose a different path. Unless you choose a different path. Uh, and there'll be multiple heaters over the years, and this is all true, man. So, it doesn't matter what heater you choose. Uh, you can decide right now if you want this to be you. Listen to the guidance that we're about to share. Higher path of success. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can be the 1% anomaly that doesn't follow this and somehow is success. But if we took 100 people, uh, the people that followed this council, almost all of them will find the way to mm. uh, success instead of just a crapshoot. <laughs> okay. uh, so we, we are, as we always do, we start with what we believe matters most when it comes to heaters and tank temp and finding a way to trust it. First one is you don't have to learn the hard way. Yeah, okay. This I, is that unless you choose a different path, this is you choosing a different path because you have a choice. Coming from somebody that likes to learn the hard way. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You know. There's like three different types of people that learn. There's like one that says, that will learn when somebody says, hey, don't touch that stove because it's hot. So I won't touch the stove. Then there's somebody that says, hey, don't touch that stove because it's hot. And then you see somebody else touch it and then it's hot and you, you learned. Like, don't touch that. Somebody else just burnt themselves. Then there's those, that group of people that's like, doesn't get matter if you get told, if you get shown, don't do it. You have to go do it yourself and touch that, that stove. So there's types of advice here. That they, you might get this advice from your doctor or something like, hey, man, that's not good for you. You should shave off a few pounds. Right? <laughs> okay. uh, you, you can get like a few different advice from different places. But mm. I wish there was like various de degrees of that advice. Like, hey, it'd probably be a good idea if you did this thing or didn't do this thing. And then... Sometimes I wish somebody would just grab your head and shake the marbles, you know, and just say, <laughs> if you it. continue doing this, you're dead <laughs> in the next 12 months. Uh, like, oh, man, okay, I'm, okay. I'm listening right, to that all right, one, right, dude. Right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish there was various degrees to yeah. uh, the counsel that, hmm. that people give because, like, I think a lot of times when people give the counsel, they just get so bored of giving this advice. The same advice. And nobody the same ever advice. listens. Yeah, yeah. It's just like this. Grain of salt. So that is why I gave it to this degree. You don't have to learn the hard way. You don't have to. You can choose a different path. And I implore you to because I want you to be successful. All right. So uh, what matters most is dual relay, uh, dual uh, thermostats, uh, dual triac or, uh, or re relay will, will have the best uh, success. Ideally, the heating element will not be hardwired to the controller. So dual thermostat, dual relay yep. means that there is in your heater is already a thermostat of some kind mm -hmm. and a, a thermometer. Or a relay. You know, whether it's incorporated into the heater yep. element or not. Yep. Uh, and this thing will turn on and off. 
but eventually after a million times it gets stuck on. That's why we plug it into like an Apex and the Apex has its own thermostat and mm -hmm. it'll just turn off the outlet. That's why you could plug it into another, Ranco. you know, just its own Ranco. Mm -hmm. that I think the Auto Aqua has a little block. You can yep. just plug it in. Yep. If it ever gets 83, it'll just turn it off. And now you have that, you know, redundancy that these things just one of them turns it off. And then like, like, I mean, you can go to the lengths of like, well, maybe I should plug one into one into one into one and like 16 of these things and get a uh, hundred percent. No. But if you do two, you know, two thermostats, two relays, essentially by having two controller boxes, you probably are in the 99%. Your trust right? for that heater just- Something really bad had to happen, you know, for, for both, both of, of those, those to fail, fail. Yeah. at the same time. Mm. Especially if you have something like an Apex, like, so if an Apex, I get alarms and stuff that will happen. Mm -hmm. And so what the biggest problem with some of the heaters is they should have an audible alarm on them that says, hey, I failed. Right? Yeah. And I got stuck and I'm continuing to rise the temperature, come save me. Well, what, what I could do with an Apex is I could set the, the temperature to be 78. If it were ever to get stuck on, I can set the alarm and the turnoff to be 79, which in case I now know that this one has failed and this one is still protecting the tank, but I should go change out the heater and not rely on this because now I only have one fail safe, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, to be honest, I don't know why nobody's produced a heater that has both of these two relays, two thermostats inside of it, and uh, a uh, audible alarm, a visual alarm, and an email notification because that would be the holy grail. Mm. Uh, but uh, in that spirit, uh, that is definitely a thing. Dual relay, dual heating element. Matters that is most. how you will not have this not happen to you. Yeah, I mean, building safeties upon safeties. This next one, uh, we believe matters most, is uh, everybody, I, I've seen so many questions asked. I mean, you see it on the product pages, like, uh, what, what size, which heater do I need for my tank? Uh, what size heater? How many watts do I need for my tank? And there's charts for wattage and different things like this. And uh, one of the easy way, easiest ways to break it down is 75-75. So... We're, t we're talking redundancy and having two heaters. Uh, one backs up the other one. Yeah, one backs up the other one. But the point is to have two heaters, two heating elements that will bring your tank 75% of the way there as far as your target temperature. Uh, so when they're both working together, you're going to hit you know, your 78 degrees. When one fails, because we just said a heater's going to die, your other heater is 75. Uh, it will, will keep you at the 75% of the, not 75 degrees, 75% of your target tank temp. The reason that we do this is one, like if I had two heating elements that brought, me, that brought me on their own, they could each bring my tank to 78 degrees, what happens when one of those uh, fails in the on position? Now I have a heat, single heating element that's already able to keep me up and I can, I'm easily going over the top. It's gonna to go faster. Faster, so, yeah. yeah. Like pretend I need a 300 watt heater to, if I was only gonna have one heater and I was 300 watts and it was capable of maintaining the tank. If the yep. thing gets stuck on, well it's gonna happen much faster because that thing's powerful. Uh, but instead, if I had two 200 watt yep. heaters, yep. right? Well, I actually need both of them to get up to uh, 78, but if one got stuck on, it's going, the problem's gonna happen about 30% slower, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, you could choose to go all the way down to each one is 50-50. 50 50%, 50, 50 yeah, yeah. So I had a 250 watt, or 150 watt heaters. Now the problem becomes if they break off, they're yeah. not really capable of supporting the temp tank temperature. Yeah. Now, you can debate all of this one way or another, all the different things you're protecting against. And the answer mm. somewhat is, do I live in a cold environment? Do I live in a hot environment? You know, what are my redundancies? But if I were to pick a general advice. Two heaters. Two heaters, they're redundant, and both of them are about 75% of what you need yeah. uh, individually. Yeah. All right. I said this for a second ago. Uh, you, you should also, what we believe most is have alarms audible visual and mobile if you can we're talking we're talking one of the number one catastrophic tank cause or tank crash causers right here being your heating element uh particularly in the on that means 
uh, of any piece of equipment that you put on your tank, if there was something that you should have a beeping loud noise in case you're asleep or in case your phone's on vibrate or what have you, uh, visual alarm saying, my God, Mom, I am overheating and you can't even tell because it looks like you can't tell the heat from your eyes, then this is one of the ones to protect. Tank says, come save me, come save me, come save me. Uh, <laughs> I want that to happen. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, when you said maybe, I, I fully believe 100% that failed heaters are the number one equipment related causes of tank crashes and failure. This is that piece that we said uh, in the previous episode, which is winning is easy, not losing is the hard part. Yeah. Heaters are avoiding the lost tanks uh, and losing from heaters is definitely fits inside that. Yeah, like, 100%. Let's just choose not to lose this way. <laughs> uh, you can do it, and it doesn't have to be that expensive yeah. as well. So Audible, so one of the visual ones can be as simple as that sticker that goes up. So I walk up, and for me, I, I lost some corals, not the whole tank, because the heater actually failed off. And I just didn't know that it was cold, and it was probably cold for weeks, because I, I don't stick my hand in yeah. it every day. If I'm a, if I'm a uh, bi-weekly or every two weeks uh, maintainer or water change, I wouldn't put my hand in the tank for two weeks potentially. So just answer, ask this question of yourself, right? If the heater broke off, how would I know? Hmm. And if you can't answer that, answer it. Hey, figure that part out. Yeah. 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 Actively okay. answer it. And then answer the other question. If the heater got stuck on, how would I know and, the and, and, and how long would I have to be able to do something about it before it nuked the whole yeah. thing? And death of your tank is not the answer. And the answer right. is cold is probably days, maybe even weeks. Hot is hours. hours. Yeah. Uh, and so answer those questions for yourself and don't just stick your head in the sand and assume it won't happen to you. Uh, and don't wait until the tank is worth protecting. Protect the journey on the way there. Mm. Uh, all right. So also choose reliable over features. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of there's a lot of heaters out there that say, uh, you know, you can calibrate and you can bring your uh, you know temperature within 0 0.05 or 0.5 or 0.2 degrees and blah blah blah. It has this feature, that feature. Yeah, I mean, you know, I used to think of the Eheim heaters as reliable. The, the big Jaegers. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. like for most of you, probably never taken one of these things apart. But you take apart like most heaters with a bunch of electronics and stuff in there yeah. that turn the thing on and off. Uh, with the the Eheim ones, the Jaegers, all it is is a bimetal thermostat. So it's just a just a sliver of like copper and a different a different uh, metal on the other side, and based on the temperature. Boop. Two little magnets come close together. It's not a single piece of electronics in the whole thing. And it just like opens and closes. Mm -hmm. I still yeah. have this in type of thermostat in my house. Okay, so <laughs> my opinion has since changed a little bit. And the reason being is these things don't tend, for me anyway, don't tend to hold accuracy very long. Mm. And so you're constantly, there's a reason why that dial on the top has the ability to calibrate it essentially, turn it to what Point it's that really little pointer happens to be doing else. at the yeah, time, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, those things also arc, and so like when those two connections come together, that's when they fuse a lot of times. And lastly, they're giant. So a 300 watt uh, Eheim Jagger is this long. Huge. Right? It doesn't fit in most uh, sumps, and it becomes a safety issue in some cases if you can't, if you start trying to do it at an angle, and some of it's exposed, and if the water level is too low, so but there's uh, some that, there's a lot of them out there that are reliable though too. Mm -hmm. And I, like warranty when you when you look at heater warranties like mm -hmm. oh, some of them are 6 months. Yeah. You know, some of them are a year. Some are 3 months. So yeah, some are super short. I, well, uh, I've never even heard of 3 months on anything. I couldn't believe it when I saw that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, actually the BRS heater so that's one of the things we like is uh, with the BRS heater is a big titanium just a, heater. Just a big metal you touch piece it, of, yeah. You know this is something different. It's heavy, it's welded, you know, all of that. Yeah. yeah, you just know it's a totally different thing the moment you touch it. Three so, years warranty. Uh, all right. This is a really important part. This is this is going to rub, this is the part we've talked about this uh, previous, and like, again, the more we talk about it, it's because it's that important to talk it's about. It's huge. Okay. Every piece of equipment on the entire tank has a usable life. Those of you that wait until it actually breaks 
has a lower percentage path to success than the people that choose to accept and embrace the fact that yep. it has a usable life. Now, if it's a return pump that costs three hundred dollars to replace, I understand that that's now, really I a hard get thing to stomach. All of my three hundred bucks out of yeah. it. Yeah. If it's a $35 heater that I've got a year's use out of and is protecting $10,000 in coral, ooh, I don't understand that one at all. That one, that one's uh, like uh, the cuckoo's nest for me. Is there a usable life? Uh, what were we talking about? Uh, the uh, life support. If you put me on a ventilator and the ventilator had a 12-month uh, warranty, usable life on it, uh, and you. You know, you paid however much dollars for it. Would you not, uh, getting close to the 12 month, uh, replace that ventilator for me to keep yeah. me alive? If the ventilator said this thing is good for about 12 months and should be replaced at that point, should you replace it if I want to keep Randy alive? Ah, right? It's still working on month yeah, let's 13. Get some, let's get some use out of it. <laughs> okay, well then, like, let's stretch it then. Let's say I really need that 35 bucks, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, well now at 18 months, it's gone 50% farther than the manufacturer suggested that it should go. Should we replace it then? Or the alternative is now is it's wait. gonna break. It's close. Should we just sit there and wait and hope that we catch it in time? Uh, Low percentage path. And this is, you know, this is specifically in the, like heaters have a usable life, but it's the, Specifically, the the uh, mechanical portions, the the you know the the actual brains of the heater, the thermostats, the different you know relays or what have you in there. Uh, you take a like, would we say we recommend you know changing these out a year every year? Um, but the BRS uh, titanium heater in the element has a three year warranty. Do I change that thing out? It's the components, right? The, it's the controller the, the part. The controller part is the one that goes on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. The element just heats up and I'm not down. as concerned about the element itself failing. Yeah. So you can go buy a really nice element and you know, it'll probably last many years. It's, the, you know, it's pumping up and down or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then if it mm -hmm. fails, like you generally have, in most cases, you'll have days, if not even longer than that, to solve the problem. It's like nothing's going to go wrong in the next six hours if the heating element fails off. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the controller piece. Yeah. The triax, the uh, relays, the, Could the fail bimetal on. thermostats, opening up a million times a year, open and close, open, close, mm. open, close, open, close. Okay, that thing is the thing that wears out. That's the part that should be replaced. Yeah. So that is one of the reasons why those BRS uh, heater con or th or, uh, heating elements are separated. Is because I don't actually need to replace the element. The element, I need to replace the controller. That's the part that wears out. Mm. Interesting. Uh, all right. Uh, in terms of temperature, actually, we talk. People use don't use chillers as much these days unless you really need to. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that people don't know uh, and should know is fans work better than you think. Have a hot tank, throw a fan on it, and you know the the confusing part for me is like, okay, so the room that I'm in is a, you know, sitting at a blistering 80 degrees or what have you. Now meaning that my tank's 80 degrees. Wouldn't putting a fan on my tank, uh, blowing 80 degree air across the top of the water, wouldn't that just not, not do anything? I had that exact dummy conversation <laughs> uh, at one point. Time, like my air conditioning in the house broke, yeah. right? Uh, and the tank was getting way out of control. And somebody's like, put some fans on the tank. And I'm like, well, why would blowing 90 degree air at an 85 <laughs> degree tank actually cool it down? because it seems like it heated up faster, right? And the answer is evaporation. Yeah. Evaporation is the release of energy. Mm. And so when you blow all that Sweet air energy. at the water, cause evaporation, the tank releases energy into the air essentially. Yeah, all that heat energy. Yeah, and so when you put the fans on, you increase the evaporation. When you aim pumps at the surface of the water, you increase evaporation, mm -hmm. and evaporation will release energy out of the tank. Yeah, so, uh, they work way better than you think. Yeah, so if, you, I mean, if you want to, I'd even just uh, just attempt this, you know, just try it out and watch your temperature one time. Get yourself a, a fan, a big box fan or something, you know, blows a lot of air and put it up over the next to the top of your tank and then just 
monitor the temperature uh, over a few hours and see how much it actually cools. Monitor how much more energy your heater, heaters soak up too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's a very interesting thing. All yeah. right, so hard lessons in relation to temp. Yes. Finding a way to trust your heater. All right, so number one hard lesson, do not plug your heater or heating element straight into the controllers, particularly the heating element. Uh, for a couple of reasons. So if we're talking like your Apex controller, right? I've got eight, uh, I got eight outlets. Um, there's like, uh, what is it? 1300 watt max capacity on the whole EB8 or whatever, what have you. Um, but you plug your heat element straight into your controller, your controllable outlet. And now you're and talking like Apex or any of the controllers, your, uh, your controller temperature probe is what's monitoring and turning the outlet on and off and on and off. Basically, essentially what you did is, we just said you have $50 uh, you know, uh, Inkbird or whatever heater controller that you wanna throw away and replace uh, uh, every year. You're now just turned your expensive two to $300 energy bar controller outlet into one of those disposable things because you're forcing it to turn off, on, off, on, off, on uh, millions of times a year. Yeah, but millions of times, right? It's actually, if it only turns on once, uh, you know, on and off every couple of minutes, you'd be surprised how much that adds up over the couple of years. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, uh, so that is true. Like, don't take your BRS heating element and plug it right into an Apex because uh, it's really not all that much better than plugging it right into, uh, or, you know, uh, you know, just a Phoenix heater yeah. with a controller built into it. You but gotta you, have d double. Yeah. So you, you gotta plug in, like, if I had to give you what I think is the safest, it's probably plug the BRS heater into the Ranco, which is really, really reliable. Mm -hmm. It's proven in all kinds of different industries. The Ranco in this case is the Aqualogic. And the difference here between the Ranco, which is like an industrial thing, and Aqualogic, is they're using a titanium probe in this case, which is designed for seawater. Yeah. All right, so the Aqualogic, and then plug that into your Apex. That is probably the best solution because you got two reliable solutions backing it up, two temperature probes, and then when either one fails, I'll have instant notification to my phone or even uh, you know with the like adaptive reef visual and audible outlets or, or uh, notifications mm -hmm. or alarms. Mm. All right, next hard lesson. <laughs> this one actually, I, I, I bet you 99% of people that are watching this haven't done this and you might really not like what you see. <laughs> uh, don't believe the thermostat. Hmm. Don't make the hard lesson of believing your thermostat. I set it to 78. Tank's going to be 78. We have tested them out of the box. Every heater, I've tested the controllers. I've tested everything. Almost none of them actually are the right temperature. Uh, and yeah. I've seen them off by as much as six degrees out of the box. Yeah. Meaning, go calibrate your heater. Calibrate. There's a reason the Apex has a calibration function mm -hmm. on it is to keep it accurate. So but go you, calibrate the thing. Even if you can't calibrate it, the other alternative, I, there's no calibration on my little Aquion heater or what have you. Okay, well, what you can do is put it in the tank, set it to 78, find out what your tank temp, uh, you know, your, your tank is or a, after the fact with a couple of thermometers and then adjust for it. Well, if it's two degrees lower, then I'll set it to 80 because obviously 78 is not 78. So if you're looking for something uh, that will you can test with like a thermometer, I'll give you a couple of different options. One, you can buy a really nice one uh, that is probably pretty accurate, NIST validated. I think like the Hanna one it fits that Hanna bill, the really traceable good. little yep. pen thing I like a lot. Yep. The team here likes the Hanna one the best. Yep. Uh, or you can go out and just use three things. You know, so everything's off by a little bit. So you can go out and get, uh, you know, like any old thermostat of any kind, even one you use for cooking, mm -hmm. uh, will probably and then just average the three together, and that's probably going to be close enough for your reef tank. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, like you might think that your tank right now is at uh, 78. And you're going to be really bummed out when you find out it's actually at 83 and you're riding the razor's edge, or it's actually at uh, 73 and you're riding a different razor's edge. <laughs> uh, and like, go find out because you're, you're probably going to be disappointed with the accuracy of these things out of the box, as well as how they behave over time. Like, like again, a piece of metal that does this and this all over that all, all the time tends to wear out, man. Death it will not fail. be accurate two years from now. <laughs> Your heater's gonna die. All right. 
Uh, uh, hard lesson here. Uh, <laughs> pegging to the tenth, and actually, lesson learned right here on the 160 with that one. So, uh, so you have your aquarium or your heater controller, whether it's you know, built in or whether it's like an apex or something like that. And I say, you know what? It'd be so awesome to keep my heating uh, fluctuation, my temperature fluctuations so close that it never leaves 78 degrees. So I'm gonna set my set point for on and off at 78.1, turn it off, and 77.9, turn it on. Uh, that tenth of a degree, which is actually two tenths, so even tighter than that. Uh, one tenth to two tenth, that means the slightest fluctuation of temperature. You talked about the, your heater turning off and on a million times a year. This is how it hits a million, a million and a half, two million times a year is because you set it so it's tight. a million times a month. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just yeah. on, off, on, off, on, off. And you don't want to talk about the, the degrading the lifespan of your heating element or whatever it's plugged into. I, if you had asked me five, six years ago, I would have said, like, why not just peg it to, you know, a tenth of a degree, just keep it at 78. Flatline it. Okay, well, A, back then I didn't realize how many of these things actually are super inaccurate, uh, and I wasn't pegging it to what I thought it was anyway. Uh, but now, I'll tell you, we burned out one of the Apex outlets by pegging it to a tenth because we were turning it on and off probably a million times a month. Yep. Uh, just on, off, on, off, on, off, on, on, off. Uh, trying to peg it, and I, I would tell you now, like, a half a degree, one way or the other, like totally changes how much a one degree on and off and i just i think even it definitely a one degree on and off i don't think you would ever notice and if you snorkeled or dived oh, yeah. you you will feel the currents change and it just the whole temperature underneath the water changes for a substantial period of time until the tide changes back the other direction there's this you know a lot of the, there's a lot of conversation about that that stability piece that comes into mind and like well if I don't have it if I'm letting it swing from you know 79 to 77 don't aren't I, aren't I losing all of the stability here don't I want like the most stable temperature I can possibly get and I mean you said it there like the natural and uh, natural ocean environment is not one set to temperature all the time everywhere you go uh, and so a two degree swing. These little things in here we already know can put up with a lot of stress and a lot of stressors that we uh, implement on them. A two degree temperature swing is probably one of the least stressful things we do to our tanks. Yeah, personally, I'd probably keep it to one. Yeah. Uh, but even two, I don't think that you're going to see a really drastic yeah. negative outcome from that. Mm. Okay. Uh, this one. This one's really pay attention to this this one because if you if 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 you have this problem, go fix it right now. Yeah. Like, don't wait. Suction, uh, cups, suction cups suck. Hard lesson, where does the temperature probe go? <laughs> right? Uh, and this means a lot of different things, actually. Yeah. So make sure the temperature probe is always submerged. It could never be unsubmerged, even if you bumped it or whatever, or any other piece of equipment failed. Meaning if I put my temperature probe in the same area as the return pump, and then the auto top off failed, and all of a sudden the water level in the return pump gets exposed, and now the heater thinks that it's actually only 70 degrees of the room, yeah. uh, it's just gonna turn on and keep heating it until you overheated the entire tank, or mm. the return pump totally fails at that yeah. point. Uh, so don't put the probe anywhere that could ever be exposed. And so part of that is actually knowing where the probe is. So on my apex, I know full well where the probe is because it's, it's a little rod. Attached right? to like a 10 foot, 12 foot court cable. Yeah, in some of my Phoenix heaters, I might know where the probe is because mm -hmm. uh, it has a, a little you know, External line that comes probe. out the yeah. side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, uh, a heater controller, uh, they will have a separate probe. And like you said, it has a suction cup. If you trust a suction cup, you've to already failed. To hold your failed. probe underwater? Mm -hmm. If you trust a suction cup on where it's gonna hold your probe underwater you can just quit now sell everything uh, it doesn't matter like just stop if you're doing that stop right now they're terrible even with the magnetic one if the magnetic one just holds it in a convenient place so be it if it's actually if you're trusting it to hold it there and if the pull pull the magnetic piece off the back see what and happens. watch how it happens right the temperature okay. probe is going to float to the top of the surface uh, also you should actually pin it so if like if it's a bunch of cords and i were to go monkey with any of the other cords would it pull that temperature probe I've out? I've had that happen too. Right? That's why the like uh, the temperature probes where you can lock them into uh, like, like a 
a pro rack or something like that and actually screw it in so it's held tightly, mm -hmm. ideal solution. So for me, like the Neptune makes like that MPR, the, the magnetic one. Mm -hmm. Not really for me. I just don't really trust to keep it that way. What I would do in that case is I might use the magnetic, but I'm gonna actually put a little bit, I drain it, put a little bit of silicone on it and stick mm. it where I want it to go. Mm. I so want it to stay there permanently and then I can use little nuts to hold the thing in there yeah. permanently. Sumps that have that built in. Yeah, that is the way to go. <laughs> That's the way to uh, go. Like, so make sure wherever you put those probes is, is smart. Also think about like, you know, the series of events, you know, like if I put the probe in a different chamber than the mm. heater, what will happen to the heater if the thing stops flowing? Yeah, right? I think I, the rule that I follow is, you know, if you have a long enough cord, I've seen temperature, I've seen uh, heaters with like a less than a six inch or six inch uh, little probe sticking out of it, which is like, what, do you, what am I gonna do with that? All I'm testing is the water that's getting heated right next to the heater, which means you know, the rest of my tank could be off, which is why I, was, I, I try to put the temperature probe uh, upstream in the sump of the heater. So it's always getting the fresh feed of water coming out of the display tank, uh, which is where the mo the bulk of the water volume is. So if the display tank is at 76 and my temp probe is upstream, then my heating element knows that, hey, I'm only 76. Keep cranking the heat to get me to 78. So I'll, I'll throw one in here too, is uh, you can have more than one probe. So like, let's say you got an Apex. Yep. You can throw another PM1 on and put another temperature probe. And I can have one that's in the sump where the heater is, and I know how the heater's functioning now, mm -hmm. right? But I could also th throw one actually in the tank, because the tank is what I actually care about. Yeah. So the problem is, like, if the return pump failed, well, yeah, now I know that... Uh, the, the little chamber little of my chamber, heater is 78 degrees. That one's just fine. The <laughs> tank's getting cold, meanwhile, right? Yeah. So uh, in some cases, you can actually, if you don't want that big probe sitting in your tank, you might even be able to just kind of put it into your overflow box, yeah. right? And you probably want to get real time and whether or not uh, that thing uh, has failed, but it will get colder around the same area as the tank. Mm. So uh, find, consider two probes, and that actually leads into another one, which is the ambient temperature probe matters more than you think. The ambient room temperature is the, I think we've said it before, uh, the temperature of your room surrounding your tank is the, is your heater uh, or your cooler or your heater. Uh, your little heaters in your tank are just secondary. They're you know, fine, bringing, tuning. fine tuning, bringing you up to the 78 degrees that you want. But it's actually like the ambient room that matters the most. So, you know, if I'm uh, summertime, I like to keep my house 78 degrees or 68 degrees. Uh, well, that means your heaters are going to be working all the time. Uh, big, oh, bigger heaters. Yeah. If, wintertime, I like to keep it at 80 degrees. Well, now my tank is uh, has the tendency to be 80 degrees because it wants to match that equilibrium of the environment that it's around when uh, and temperature wise. And so I need more fans. The air surrounding the tank, the temperature of the air surrounding the tank more is important. the primary heater. It's your heater. Right? Heater so, or cooler, same, same. So forgetting about your heater and its ability to fail, it's almost like weird little oddball things. Like a family member decided to, uh, you know, crank the heat up, yeah. decided to, bumped it by accident, decided to uh, turn it down, decided, let's get some fresh air today on a 90 degree day and opened up all the windows and turned the air conditioning off. Yeah. Or the air conditioning broke, you know, and, and all the windows were closed and you weren't at home. And so that's one of the things you can also do with an aquarium controller is you could get another temperature probe and literally just put Ambient. it in the air. Mm -hmm. And so when it's in the air, it will tell me the temperature of the room that it's in. Yep. You could probably get the same thing from like a nest or something too. I ah, but the hard lesson here is that a nest may be a bad idea. Not so much so in that you're monitoring the temperature of the ambient room, but for a different reason, I'll say okay, in a second. Okay, we'll share that in a second. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to hear that one. <laughs> uh, okay, so the, the temperature probe though, if you get another temperature probe and you just put it in the ambient air of the room, I will know if my air conditioning failed, I yep. will know if my furnace failed, I will know if somebody uh, with little teeny fingers decided to monkey with it. <laughs> I don't know if we opened up the windows. I don't know if uh, somebody just did something silly in mm -hmm. the house that is going to cause a whole series of problems outside of my heater because your furnace and your home's AC 
are the primary temperature controls of the tank. You're just not thinking about it that way. Yeah, we used ambient room temperature probes on uh, this, the E170 and the ULMs when it was in your office, the 750. I just found out the last night that the 750 secondary it was getting cold, the tank was getting cold, and the secondary heating element for the 750 was set to be controlled by the actual ambient room temperature thermometer, so it wasn't even kicking on because oh it was 78 degrees. Uh, but it's little things like that that can you know trigger something. If my tank's going 80 degrees, 81 degrees, I'm like, well, man, is there something wrong with my house? I look at my house, and it's like, oh, no, it's 76. Something's wrong with the tank and the tank uh, heater. All right, tell me why the nest is a bad <laughs> idea. I wrote that we added that the nest may be a bad idea. Uh, uh, I, love smart, I love smart outlets. I love smart things. I love the smart nest thermometer thought I really wanted one for my house. These things were going to be cool. I can control my temperature from not even being at home. I can turn the AC on before I get there. I can turn the heater on before I get home. Come to find out, like, I have a reef tank in my house, and because the ambient room temperature is the primary source of heating and cooling for my tank, I have to keep it, you know, within a reasonable range, whether or not I'm home or not. I can't leave home for the weekend, shut my heat, my heat off, or turn it down to 50 degrees. Because I have a tank in there that now my heaters have to work three times as hard. Vice versa in the heat in the summertime. I can't turn my AC off when I leave uh, because I need that cold uh, that cold air conditioning for my tank. Yep. So they're you cool. Know, <laughs> it's just when you have a tank, it's a different story. The nest was about turning up and down based on the fact whether or not we are in the home. Yep. Uh, well, now we have other organisms we're taking care of. We've got a slice of Fiji living in our house <laughs> that actually requires this as well. Yeah, it sucks. Okay. So in that spirit, uh, another hard lesson. Letting the heater melt the sump. Mm. Right? So this will happen primarily. The number one way this will happen is if you put the heater in an area where it could ever be exposed. And when I mean ever, I mean under... Any weird experience that you could ever have, it will expose. Number one being, you put the heater in the return pump area and the outer top off failed, and that little area evaporated mm. pretty quickly and they sucked all the water out. That's an artifact from what we talked about yesterday of if I don't, if you don't need like adjustable or variable water levels, then for me, the best return chamber doesn't have baffles in it. It's just the whole sump itself. The second uh, most important part of this whole thing would be if I got a heater that was too big, uh, being you know, those big, long e -hams, it's Turn it sideways. And I had to turn it sideways. Uh, and then if uh, anything ever happened, the auto top off would be the number one, or return pump failure, actually, in this case, too. Uh, will be, you know, the problem will be that it'll get it exposed uh, and, like, it'll melt right through the sump. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, and that happened, actually, in the auto water change uh, bin at my house. Yeah. Well, it happened here, too. Uh, so I had it. It didn't melt through the bottom of the container. Mm -hmm. It melted through the uh, RO tubes that were around it. Luckily, uh, it was kind of dangling there. But uh, one of the settings I had were, were, were wrong. And yeah. uh, when it drained all the way, man, the heater stayed on and melted through the tubes. Well, we had it happen in a mixing bin here. And actually, it crashed the tank because there it mm. led to copper in the tank, in the water. <laughs> Water, and the water change water and then somebody was doing water changes with that water that now had all that me exposed metal but basically it was, it was just the heating element plugged into the wall straight in no controller on it or anything no apex or anything and using the internal controller uh, of the thing it worked when it was submerged in water but once you drained all of the salt water out there if you don't start filling that bin right back up well if somebody let the bin go dry for however many days the next thing we know you pull the heater out and it's completely melted. So if this, if the heater is in any place that you think that it could be submerged uh, or would not be submerged in any strange form or fix way. Fix that today. Fix that today. Uh, on a solution to that might be the PTC heaters that we're learning more about. I don't know enough about them right now to tell you about it, but it might be part of the future in this one. Also, we'll I tap. forgot about this. Uh, in terms of where the thermostat is, if you don't know where the little dangly cord is and you don't see it on your heater, it's usually in the very top the of cap. the heater. It's yeah. in the cap. Uh, and so like if you're like, sometimes people, you know the neotherms were really weird because they would tell you don't submerge the whole thing. But then if you talk to the people that actually make them, they're like, oh yeah, you definitely need to submerge the whole the thing because the thermostat's in, in the top. Like, well, 
pick a path, guys. You know, <laughs> I, I, don't know. I always submerge mine and I stuck them on the bottom. I don't buy heaters now without uh, an external temperature thermostat or just the heating element with a controller. So the problem actually when you incorporate the, the thermostat into the top of it is that the heating element actually heats the thermostat up and you end up with more on-off cycles. Mm -hmm. And what we have found is that the ones where they incorporated into the cap, like when we take a 70 gallon tank and try to get it up to 78, it takes 10 times as long as one with an external one because the external one will just stay on until it gets to 78. Whereas the one that's in the cap, it's constantly overheating and constantly turning yeah. off and waiting. And so yeah. incorporating the thermostat or the, or the temperature probe into the heating mill itself, it is less than ideal, I guess, <laughs> uh, in my opinion. Uh, all right. So uh, we talked about open windows, tank and uh, sump, tank and sump are different, uh, ambient lessons. temp, uh, put it in the return area, super bad idea, uh, letting it melt the sump, the nest, open windows. <laughs> All right, so what's next? All right, we're, ne we're now on episode nine of the 52 Weeks of Reefing. This one was titled, why flow is vital for a successful reef tank. So many, uh, you know, breakthroughs and lessons learned and things that we've learned about flow over the decades or how or whatever, especially recently in recent years, the last five years. Uh, we're going to bring you up to speed uh, with our core belief. So core belief, the thing that drives all of the decisions that we make, uh, where we believe will, people will see the highest success paths. Okay, if a return pump is the heart of the system, water flow is the blood. Mm -hmm. Flow is what delivers and eliminates most of what the corals rely on to live. So corals have like a, I guess a semi-permeable membrane essentially yeah. with their tissue and everything that they need is delivered from the surrounding water. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be delivered at a rate that it can actually get through the boundary layer and hit the tissue, right? And also, all of the things that it needs to get rid of, the mm -hmm. byproducts and oxidants of uh, photosynthesis, it gets rid of through the pumping mechanism, essentially, of the water. And the more water flow, the better it's able to get rid of these things. Bring right? it in and get rid of. So yeah. it is very much, I'll read it again, uh, if the return pump is the heart, the water flow is the blood, the flow is what delivers and eliminates most of what the corals rely on to live. The better we are at doing this will be the determination between whether or not the corals simply survive or whether or not they thrive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So starting with what we believe matters most when the terms of flow and why it's so vital, uh, it starts with WWC. Uh, a lot of uh, flow concepts, uh, uh, many flow concepts, comes from uh, our mentors over at WWC when, it, when they talk about flow. So WWC says you will get more results from ideal flow than ideal lighting. I know, it's really hard to consume because people spend so much time on light. worrying about perfecting lighting Porn. and so little time about perfecting flow. It's mind-boggling. Yeah, uh, right. Well, I, right now I can't measure any uh, measure flow in my tank. That's probably yeah. maybe it. Yeah. yeah, it's not as easy to digest or understand. We're going to start doing some BRS TV investigates mm -hmm. uh, probably right after, uh, probably January. So yep. we'll start yep. these things. We're going to better understand flow, and you're going to start once you start getting the visuals with it. It's almost like the salt bix. Like until you showed me the clarity, until you yeah. showed me the uh, the gunk and in an environment outside no of idea. a gray bin. Yeah. Uh, when I get it, I get it. The flow thing will probably give you We're that gonna too. Get it. We're going to get there. All right. So in that, what we matter most to uh, also came from uh, Josh here at WWC. It's not a mythical X turnover, but eliminating dead spots. So it's not just about having two pumps at the side that all have 50 times turnover, because yeah. if you go actually look at it, you might have 50 times turnover as a number, but like in the areas where the aquascape kind of juts out or everywhere else, it might be zero, zero times turnover. Like almost no water is moving around there. And we just said that the corals, you know, need flow to one bring in, you know, food, nutrients, and you know what they, uh, some of the things they need through that semi-permeable membrane. And two, it needs to expel some of those oxidants and waste. Well, 
If I'm, uh, if I'm unable to eat and I'm unable to go to the bathroom, I'm going downhill real quick. If you go look at your tank and you're like, hey, there's a little pocket area. These corals actually they are surviving, but they're not really growing as fast as everything else. Check consider the flow. flow. Yeah. Consider whether or not it's flow. Uh, and so uh, eliminating dead spots. That means that I'm not just like tied to my favorite brand of uh, Vortex or whatever. It might mm -hmm. be the primary flow on the sides of it, but I can go ahead and add the Tuneses or Gyres or Waves whatever, or aim CJs. them at the areas yeah. you know, yeah. that uh, behind the rock, through the little uh, caves or whatever. And are you gonna get every single last dead spot? No. no. but. Then smartly place your corals in area in uh, those other areas. Well, I, you know, you don't have to. The, the goal isn't always perfection, man. It's just better. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, you can do better than two pumps on either end of your tank for sure. Especially if you visually can see, hey, you know, that area is not doing as well as I'd like. We'll solve that. You can, mm. uh, and you can also choose to solve it beforehand instead of waiting for it because <laughs> it, it's actually just true. So, uh, and the answer to how much flow is as much as they will tolerate. So if the corals look like they don't like it, they don't. Mm -hmm. Short of that, it's not enough. Yeah. Uh, so just, just figure out whatever that is and aim them at the areas. Yeah. Uh, another area I think that we've explored is not pounding them in the exact same way every day. Mm. Uh, varied point of turbulence. Yeah, this one was really interesting. Um, the if I got uh, a wind from one direction and the sun from one direction all of the time and I am a stagnant piece of human and I cannot move and I'm just dependent on variations in that, uh, I'm not gonna survive very well. I'm not gonna thrive very well. Well, A, you probably won't live very long and also you'll probably be weirdly shaped. I'll, I'll be shaped like this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. yeah, what we're looking for is varied turbulence. Yeah. Yeah, so, and this is, uh, with modern technology and modern, you know, pump flows and changing flows and things like that, a reef crest mode is a really very popular one with the MP40s. <laughs> the alternating gyre mode on gyres is a really popular one, too, because instead of two pumps, a, a, like, think of AC pumps pointed at each other, both running at 1,000 gallons per hour, smack it in the middle of the tank, and that's all they do 24-7, or even just one pump that's pouring over like this. Uh, but that it's changing that point where they hit together, so... What if I increase ramp up this pump while this pump decreases? Well, now that point intersecting point of turbulence changes over here. And then what if I ramp up this one while this one decreases? Well, now that point of turbulence changes. And really, I'm end up, what I end up doing is creating currents in the tank. So basically, you're going to have water jets shooting at each other, mm -hmm. right? If they're all both at 100%, they'll probably meet in the middle and then just start blowing up, right? Yep. If I turned one to 80% and then the other one uh, to 20%, it's probably right here. Or even 100% mm -hmm. to 20%. It's yeah. probably way over here. And I can actually flip that and move it over here. And then I can even do better if I got pumps on the back because it's not just left, right and left now. It's flushing out from underneath the yeah. aquascape, behind the aquascape, through the holes. And then the more varied turbulence, the more the uh, the better the flow for the corals, better of the delivery of the elements they need, the better ability to get rid of it, but also the less likelihood that they're going to grow in like really weird oddball shapes. Yeah. You know, you're going to get a nice little colony out of it. So, uh, very point of turbulence and changing it, and it doesn't have to be super complex. On, on my first tank, uh, David Gregor told me. Turn on this pump for a half hour, turn on this pump for a half hour, and then uh, turn on both pumps for a half hour. So they're kind of going this way, then they're going this way, and then it's just turbulent all over. <laughs> uh, and that worked just fine for mm -hmm. me. So it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be like super have duper be, advanced. Yeah, all these fancy modes and stuff like that. No. Yeah, and a lot of times the wave makers uh, of the world that are turning on little pulses for five seconds, if you watch, like you don't really get water moving in five seconds just yeah. like, ooh, stop ooh, stop, ooh. stop where if you leave it on man it like really starts to create a current so in most cases i think you want to leave them on long enough to create a sustained current, current rather than like little pulses and now one exception to that is if i have a tank just like filled with euphilia and i got aim uh, corals aimed all over the place little pulses might actually be the way to get lots and lots of flow without like pounding them so mm. the right tool for the right job mm. Uh, another thing that we believe matters most, flow and lighting are joined at the hip, and we're talking bleaching. Uh, and I mean, you just heard, you know, 
you just heard why flow is so important to the corals because it's the delivery mechanism for uh, for what they need, but more importantly, it's the export mechanism from the byproducts of photosynthesis. Well, uh, lighting. If I am if I'm pushing photosynthesis and turbocharging as hard as I can because I know that uh, they are photosynthesizing the most at. 200 to 350 par and uh, I keep my tank at 250 par throughout the main part of the day constantly photo photosynthetic uh, photosynthesizing meaning there's a lot of byproducts being made which means there's even more that need to be flushed away these are why these two are joined at the hip so one of the main reasons people believe that corals bleach is actually because they can't get rid of the oxidants mm. created from photosynthesis as fast as they're being created. Right. Uh, and those oxidants are just gonna kill it rapidly. And so eventually the coral just says, I have to stop producing all these oxidants and the only way I can do it is expel all the zooxanthellae into the water. Bleach. Right, and then it bleaches and it'll probably die mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just a last ditch attempt to survive. To save in itself, that world, yeah. right? So if you're gonna ride the razor's edge of lighting, you have to ride the razor's edge of flow to help that coral get rid of all of those toxins that it's creating through excess photosynthesis. Mm. So that's why in the wild it's like shutting itself down in many cases. In those cases. peak hours right? of the day, right? When it's 1200 par or whatnot. And so and, and in the wild, you may have like constant flow solving that problem uh, as well. There's strong currents, there's all kinds of things. So mm -hmm. yeah, think about that, that flow and lighting are joined at the hip. Don't attempt to ride the like high end of uh, lighting and if then, you're not going to ride uh, the high end of flow. And, and again, not because I got 50x or 150x a or whatever. Yeah. No, it's about getting flow where it needs to go and as much of it as possible. Wow. All right. Another one thing that we believe matters most that probably a lot of people have heard by this, but many people might not know, is uh, when a pump is clean, it takes less power or, uh, or more power than when it's dirty. Yeah, so this was just uh, an epiphany moment when we, where we tried it on the 160, where it's like, ah, okay, so there was a day that, uh, and I don't know if it was the, the start of that, but there was a day when I noticed that, you know, one of, our, one of my canary corals up here that I was uh, watching the whole time, uh, back when I was taking care of the tank, uh, just, it was it was a STN. It was a slow tissue uh, necrosis that was happening, and uh, I couldn't figure out what it was. And I'm watching. I was like, "Okay, chemistry's right." I sent an ICP test and all this other stuff. Come to find out, I put your hand in the tank, and that gyre pump that is usually running just was completely dead. Uh, it wasn't running, and it was caked over. Uh, and then the you know the latest model of the Ap uh, Apex came out, and you have individual outlet power monitoring where you can say if my power is outside of one of these ranges, let me know and alert me. And then you're just like, okay, so let's turn on the power monitoring for a power head and just find out what happens. And sure enough, wattage draw started going down as the pump got dirtier meaning uh, we're not getting the flow that we are, had out of it. I'm not an electrical engineer. I would have thought the opposite. I, I would have thought 100%. Have, if it was yeah. gunked up, it, you would think the pump is working Trying harder. Trying really hard to yeah, push that prop. And it's going to suck up more juice. Yeah. is the opposite. opposite. Spin slower, and then it sucks up less juice. But you can use this tool. Like, that. You can use that knowledge for a whole lot. Apply it to a whole lot of other things here. But specifically, as flow is concerned, I can apply it to uh, everything that pushes water around in my tank. It's, it's about that life support thing. It's about like if the return pump and we want to monitor that and we want to have redundancy there, well, if the water and flow is the blood, wouldn't I want to know if it's running 70% lower or in your case, zero? Yeah. Yeah, I do want to know, man. I want to know quickly. Good. And yeah, one of the frustrating parts that I found actually was during that whole process, what we were doing is we were using air bubbles and stuff to figure out the perfect flow. We were watching the turbulence going back and forth. We spent like a whole day, you know, perfecting the flow on the tank. And then I walked up to it like a month later and I'm like, it is not doing what I thought. And I blew the air bubbles and it's not doing it. Yeah. yeah and I found out it's because They're even dirty. just after a month <laughs> that the gyres had like slowed down so much that it wasn't producing the same thing yeah, that I thought. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so I like it, Really having an understanding that a clean pump actually takes up more power, a dirty pump actually takes up less power, is how you can use the kilowatt, how you can use the power monitoring mm -hmm. on a controller mm -hmm. 
to tell you when to clean the things and actually have the blood helping yeah. you get rid of the toxins and add the nutrients. And you're not, yeah, you're not cleaning the pumps for the sake of the pump. You're cleaning the pumps for the sake of the corals. That's the best thing you said all day. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will take my coffee. And go you're not on. doing it for maintenance, man. You're doing it because the organisms inside the tank rely on you they to, need to, it. to care for them. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. Uh, another thing we believe that matters most when it comes to flow is it's uh, if. If it's easy to clean, you will do it. And I mean, obviously this applies to a lot of different things, but specifically like power heads and flow. If it takes me two seconds to pull out a, a you know, like the wet side of an eco, of a, a Vortec and put in a new one and maintenance is done, I am, I'm way, knowing myself, I'm a hundred times, a hundred percent more likely to do it because I, I'm even looking at uh, some harder to clean pumps in my tank in my office. I know they need to be clean, but I know the time I, in the back of my mind, like what what that's going to take for time, and that just makes me procrastinate even longer. Okay, I'll give you three different outcomes for cleaning your return or your your power heads. One of them is a Vortec. I have an extra set of wet sides around. I walk up to the tank. I swap them out. I'm done. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, another one is. Uh, I walk up the tank and decide to clean up my gyres, my tuneses, my CJs, my whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I've uh, zip tied everything down and it's all super neat and clean. And I have to go cut all of that apart. I haven't left myself with any slack. And so I have to go in the back to cut it out. And I had to remove the whole thing. Guess what I'm not going to do. I will never in a million years <laughs> do that. Uh, and so you may have just, it, like, it just made it impossible to do. Yeah. If, however, what you do is leave yourself a couple feet of slack and you happen to have a bucket, you can just take the pump and put it in the bucket with some citric acid and have it run and it will clean for the most part. Uh, you may want to actually disassemble it after that and get all of the stuff out sure. of it. Uh, but, but you even, just made it easier. You made it easier, but I will tell you that this still takes an hour of your day. Not only an hour full time, but uh, it still takes, I gotta go get the stuff, mix it up, put the bucket there, find something for the bucket to sit on, put the pump in there. Yeah. Uh, and that is why people probably don't do it. So when you're selecting the pumps that you want to use in your tank, think about how important the flow is. It's part of the life support system. How fast it's going to fail you. If it fails, what would happen? And what do I need to do to it's prevent amazing. that? And in my mind, the Vortex arguably, uh, almost unarguably, the easiest solution because you can walk up and just swap them out, you're done. And when I bought my Vortex, I'd buy an extra wet side right then and there because yeah. you're missing half the value if you can't do that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people hear that advice, you know, coming from us or, or what have you and say, oh, they're just trying to push Vortex pumps and stuff like that. No, like I, I believe it wholeheartedly because I am a I suck at being consistent with maintenance. So it needs to be convenient and easy for me to do, so that I will do it. You know, honestly, I don't even want to bother with that mindset anymore. Yeah. Like you know, you just kind of defend against that idea of like, hey, well, you know, Ryan and Randy sell stuff. You know, like yeah, do full full well. But you know what we do is we help people be successful, and that is the end of the story. If you're lazy so like me, if you're successful, uh, the longer uh, it's in your best interest, it's yeah. our best interest. If you sell you garbage that uh, won't help you. Uh, that is nobody's best interest. <laughs> so uh, swapping out and having easy maintenance and providing life support for the tank, if you believe higher in that. Higher path to success. Yeah, okay, this better, the yeah. the point of what we're doing here. Core belief here isn't, how do we make most money selling pumps? You know, <laughs> no. A core belief is, if the return is the heart, the water flows the blood, flows what delivers and eliminates most of what the corals rely on to live. That is the thing that we need to solve. Base our decisions it's off in of. everyone's best interest. Yep. Uh, another thing that we believe matters most when it comes to flow, and we will learn in the upcoming year, we have so many flow tests planned out, is that wide versus narrow versus a sheet or a blade. Uh, it goes back to the, you know, I'm gonna fill my pump full of uh, tunes uh, because I love tunes. Yeah, they're good at you know, a specific job, but you really what we should be picking our pumps for is not necessarily brand affinity, not necessarily gallons per hour either. We're gonna find that out too, is I, uh, should I be picking 2,000 gallon per hours and looking in 2,000 gallon per hours across all the different brands? 
pr not even close. What we should be considering is the flow pattern and the needs for our tank. Flow pattern meaning I may have a 2,000 gallon per hour pump that has a very narrow beam and high, to high velocity type pump versus a 2,000 gallon per hour pump that has a wide angle, slow and low velocity. Those are two completely different types of pumps and gallons per hour had absolutely nothing to do with that, uh, with it and it shouldn't be a part of the decision making process. Who cares? If it, yeah. yeah. So I'll give you a couple of examples. If I have a LPS tank, I want really wide cones of water that doesn't just blast everything. Yeah. Flow that surrounds and gets everything, mm -hmm. keeps it moving, mm -hmm. but I'm not pounding it, you know? Yeah. Uh, if I've got a SPS tank, I usually want turbulence and so almost like little laser beams that hit each other and then vary <laughs> around and create a lot of turbulence yeah. in, in, in the water. Uh, if I'm on the back of the tank, something like a gyre turns sideways, shoots water in a sheet across the back and creates a motion around the tank. Yep. If I want to get water over the top of the tank, blade. a cone isn't going to do that very no. well. A blade like a gyre really will. If I want to get uh, uh, from the top into a little cave down below, actually, uh, like a, I can look at the tunes and I know already what they do just by looking at them. The ones that have an extra tune on the outside actually focus that into like a little laser beam that will get it down where I need it to be yeah. which is flushing out through that cave if the mouth of the tunes is open and wide it's going to shoot it in a big uh, mm. uh, a wide angle so it's not about the brand or it's not about the gallons per hour it's, it's about zero right tool, right job, understanding what the type of flow I'm trying to create and then applying it to that solution. You're gonna see that probably with every single pump that we make. You're gonna see yeah. visually how these things create turbulence. You're gonna see how they actually, the angle, the degree that they come out yep. and give a way that you can visually see it and then imagine it in your own tank. I foresee a future and I really hope it comes true where you don't see gallon per hour rating on the pumps anymore, especially like in a description. Like it would be nice to know like what I'm getting into, but instead of gallon, just, hey, 2000 gallons per hour, this is what it does max, or, or blank to blank, uh, this is what it does. How about it's cone shaped 2000 gallons per hour, it's wide angle 2000 gallons per hour. There should be some terms in the hobby that define what we're getting into so I can make an informed decision just by reading what it is. I'm gonna take a stab at this. And I, I don't, this isn't right yet, okay. but like I like the gallons per hour because I know how much water it's turning over. Yep, 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 yep. But what if it gave me velocity at feet, mm. right? So one foot away from it, if I got a laser beam, it's shooting water so at you know, 60 or 10, 10 feet a, a second or whatever, right? But if I had a big giant cone, it's also 2,000 gallons an hour and a foot out, it's probably only going to do a velocity of a half a foot a second. Oh, right? I can make a smarter decision yeah. on what it's So done. I got the gallons per hour, but I also know the velocity of the water, the speed at which it's traveling at uh, certain intervals. Yeah. Mm. I, I think it would be very this helpful. This is going to be great, uh, great testing coming up next year. Okay. Uh, another one here, and this goes back to the electricity thing, uh, and I'm going to... I think this is important. This is like, think about where you live. If you live in California, you have brownouts constantly, big deal. Uh, if you're a, in a, a hurricane area, big mm -hmm, deal. Mm -hmm. If you're in a tornado area, big deal. Ice storms, if you snow haven't, storms. If you haven't ever had a power outage in your lifetime, not a big deal. Uh, but higher, I, pa higher path of success here. Higher path of success. I wouldn't even. Uh, I wouldn't run a tank without a power head that's attached to a battery backup. Meaning, the only ones I can think of off the top of my head are the Tunes's and with the safety switch or connector. Yep. Uh, I think there's one for the gyre. Gyres, that one kind of comes ebbs and flows. Yeah. Uh, then uh, also the big uh, one for the uh, Vortex. I would not run a tank that ha doesn't have a single power head that's plugged into one battery backup. If I had to, I would use the UPS. You heard us earlier talk about how mm -hmm. those things don't run very long and they're, they're actually not the greatest value per dollar, right, right. like by a pretty big magnitude. But at the same time, and it doesn't mean that all of the pumps have to be on a battery at backup. At least one. Just one. 
right? So if I had a Vortec on the thing and it was on a battery backup, all the rest of them could be whatever I wanted. Mm. I don't have to have that. If I have one tunes that's on a battery backup, it's probably enough. But again, the water flow, which is the thing that's creating gas exchange, it's getting rid of the excess CO2, it's adding oxygen to the tank, it's keeping everything alive. Mm. If that stops, the blood flow, uh, what's happened here is the power goes out, the circulatory system's gone, the heart's gone, the life will be gone quickly it's, after. It's like putting you in a sealed room uh, for and saying, all right, how long, uh, start the timer on how long you can breathe until you're gone. Like, yep, it works it, until it doesn't. Until it doesn't. Yeah, ah. depends how big the room is, uh, but yeah, uh, and also depends on how many people are in there. Yeah, exactly. So if it's just me and Randy Can sitting in this big old room, we got know. we got some time. We got some time. <laughs> uh, if we go in the closet and seal it, uh, yeah, less we time. We got less time. If we put sixty people in here, less time. So think about your tank in that manner yeah. too. Like how many things are consuming all of those things. The time in which you have to react uh, is very proportional to the amount of life depending yeah. on it as yeah. well. Uh, another thing we believe that matters most uh, <laughs> in terms of flow. Uh, and I found this one on my own uh, until um, the MP10s or MP40s or any of the Vortec pumps, they just look awesome on the back of a tank. Like if you have a cube tank, yeah, I've had multiple cube tanks, they painted black or even a, just a regular tank with some space behind the wall, uh, they just disappear. So it's kind of like this. Uh, it's if I put the MP40s on this side or the, you know, they're kind of like a cordless option because there's no cord in the tank, mm -hmm. right? I don't see any wonky, irregular cords in the tank, which is what distracts from the beauty of the whole thing. But there's cords on the outside, but if I had to pick one or the other, I'll put them on the outside. Yeah. But if you put the cords on uh, the motor on the back of the tank, like we do with the 60 cubes, uh, and you can just kind of flush water around in different directions, well, now you can't see a single cord on any of it. There's no pumps that are really visible at all. I mean, like the really only true, like I guess, cord really cordless option is probably a closed loop. Yeah. But uh, putting the MP40s in the back, man, if you can do it and it provides the flow that you want, <laughs> is the most aesthetically pleasing option, bar none. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and you actually just hit the next one too. Uh, what believe matters most? Closed loop is the only uh, true cordless uh, flow option. So you know what another thing a closed loop is actually good at is getting flow from the bottom yeah, up, yeah, right? Because you can put little nozzles in. Mm -hmm. I, Sean's tank, uh, the 2,000 gallon tank that we went and toured a couple years back, uh, he had a lot of those closed loop systems, uh, pumps coming up from the flow, coming up from the bottom. And good, I mean, it, it, for a size of tank that huge, you ha almost have to consider closed loop because the amount of, and he's growing SPS and sticks in there. We just said flow is, you know, one of the biggest components when you're in, he's got you know, 20 Orphix or whatever uh, on his thing. So he's riding the razor's edge of light. How do you fill a giant tank like that with flow uh, without filling the entire viewing panes full of power heads? Cords. The closed loop. Yeah, cords, power heads, plug-ins, the whole nine. Closed loop was the uh, solution. So people ask a lot, like, should I do a closed loop? My answer is generally no, because uh, power heads are so much easier to use and they fit the 99%. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. All right, but if you have a big tank or you have a big aversion to cords, closed loops are the best. And it used to be also that a closed loop required a big, noisy AC pump, uh, and they're inefficient, they produce, produce a lot of heat and stuff. And now with the, today's DC pumps that are quiet, you can actually, and they're smaller, mm -hmm. you can put the closed loops all over the place and it actually probably wouldn't be that hard. Yep. You're gonna have little more leak points with bulkheads drilled in, you're gonna Swiss cheese your, your <laughs> tank a little bit. It's a much more complex install. So kind of like the way I look at it is, if you had to ask, uh, probably PowerEd's a better solution for you. Yep. Uh, if you want a closed loop and you've done all the research on how to do it uh, properly, well then a closed loop, actually is one of the cleanest ways to add, uh, uh, especially if you build your aquascape first, put the aquascape in the tank, mm -hmm. and then say, where do I want to drill the yeah. holes for the closed loop? We'll probably have the best flow solution the, known to man. No, no cords, no power heads, no nothing, maintenance is. You can hide it inside the rock uh, even. Maintenance is a breeze. Yeah, ah. so there you go. There you go. Uh, 
Also, you heard it a little bit earlier that uh, one of the things I believe most matters is uh, either just use uh, your manual pressure out of your chest or get an <laughs> air pump uh, and blow bubbles into the tank and watch where they go. Yeah. Watch the velocity, watch the empty spots, watch for like, oh my gosh, I had no idea there was mm -hmm. no flow there at all. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've done this a couple times. We first started doing that on the 160. Um, we got an, like a, an air pump that had four or five different valves, and then you just kind of drop the little tips in the right underneath the power head. Uh, you just kind of drop one of those air, air lines underneath there and let the bubbles go up into the power head. And the power, it will tell you where all your flow is going. And you could easily see like the change in the turbulence when you were watching these bubbles. You watch those bubbles, you know where they're going. Couple of tidbits though. Uh, one, if you blow too much air, it actually slows the pump down, yes. so it's not an accurate uh, depiction of where the air bubbles are. Also, if you can find ways to make smaller, finer bubbles, they'll stay in suspension in the water longer rather than float to the top. So, yeah. uh, like something like even like a, a skimmer motor could do that, yeah. uh, an air stone could do that. Uh, but just finding ways to make smaller bubbles will allow you to see the flow pattern better. And that's probably one of the best tools, you know, using that air pump or even your breath or whatever it is, just to look at where is the flow going and where isn't it going. And you might also correlate, oh, wow, that's why at, that coral looks like crap. Yeah, that coral has <laughs> always been, you know, white and pale and just really weird looking right there. Not hardly grew. Still a frag. And then here we are, you know, however many months later. Uh, although the bubbles aren't even reaching there or the bubbles just stop when they get there. Yep. Ah. All right. Uh, uh, there's one tied right next to that. Uh, yep. It's uh, use the feed mode, we believe matters most. Mm. Using, using the feed mode, uh, you know, there's so many, you know, use the, one of the biggest problems when feeding, of course, when uh, you always hear every, all over the time, is don't let it go down the overflow. And, you know, there's uh, smart return pumps that are so smart that they, keep the lines charged but they don't let the drains come back and you know probably one of the one of the easiest ways to keep food from going down your overflow is to slow down your flow pumps your power heads so that they're not kicking all the food around and you actually uh, you have a, you know, a spot where your fish can come and feed rather than chasing it all over and then out it goes out into the overflow it is true use the feed, uh, mode. feed mode 10 minutes use it. Uh, you can save a lot of nutrients yeah use half the food half the nutrient uh, and still feed the same amount. <laughs> uh, all right, so one thing also is flow is a million times easier in a bare bottom. That's true. Not blowing around the sand, so that's one of the reasons it's bare bottom. Up. Uh, I will tell you this is what I found out too. I mean, we're actually talking about, I mean, the Vortec does a lot of things that are unique, so that's probably why we talk about it all the time. But uh, the Vortec, you can put it on the bottom and shoot water across the bottom. Yeah. Now, technically speaking, you could do that with any pump, mm -hmm. right? True. Just put it down the bottom. The problem will be is it's bad enough to have a wonky cord coming out of the top. It's, it's much worse if you have to have the cord go all the way to and the bottom. And you know the cord does this the whole way down. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why nobody's ever like created a nice straight thing. We've said that so yeah. many times. I mean, if you could just silicone like a little thing with a cord in it, yeah. then maybe I would put a tune to the bottom. It wouldn't really matter that much. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, SP, if SPS dominated, riding the razor's edge of flow and lighting and all this other things, uh, that's probably why I'm so tied to the bare bottom, even though I know it's a harder harder hump to get over initially in the first two years. But, uh, it, but I can ride that, that flow. It just flushes all the gunk off the bottom, and it goes yeah. right out down the drain yeah. and pulled out by your roller mat, skimmer, filter sock, whatever it is. So 100%. I, I, if I had a bare bottom, I would have pumps on the bottom for sure. If I had, had to, I'd aim them down at the bottom. But having like a, after I've done it in a few different tanks, we did it in the 60 cubes where the Vortex were on the bottom. We did it in uh, my own tank, the 360 shooting across the bottom. We've done it in the worldwide uh, coral tank yep. shooting across the bottom. It keeps it so much cleaner and like reduces a lot of maintenance and just all the gunk is gone. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a much cooler thing. All right. Hard lessons in relation to flow. Why flow is vital for a successful reef tank? Hard lessons that we've had, you should try to probably try to avoid. Avoid these lessons, that's what we're telling you. First one is don't blast anything, it'll make it ugly. 
Yeah, if you blast a coral with flow, if it doesn't blow the tissue off, it will actually grow. Grow in weird. this weird pattern. So, uh, that's yeah. why you have buried flow. That's why you don't put a pump blasting right on something. You try to get it around uh, and creating turbulent flow that doesn't come from just two pumps. There's nothing worse than seeing uh, the tip of your neon green torch, uh, little pieces of it floating around the tank because you blasted it with flow and it, just, it lost yes. the tips. Oh, terrible. Uh, okay, another hard lesson, and you heard of this. I really like gyre, so it kind of sounds like, I, I, like we're it's hating not a, on them. Not a dig on them. No, it's just real. that They real. slow down faster than most pumps. Yeah. They require more maintenance. You have to clean them more mm. often. Uh, it's been my experience anyway. Yep, same. Uh, and so just hard lesson. Just remember that. Know that because you're going to end up in the experience that you talked about is it actually will stop entirely and then corals start dying. Yeah, and I mean, especially, and this is kind of what came out of, uh, this is where the, see how, you know, we aquascape the 160 higher than a half, halfway up the tank. Uh, and then you run into this problem where your corals are growing up to the surface. And, you know, without a, a pump like a gyre, we, it would be very difficult for us to solve for that, that issue of corals growing now up to the top of the tank because it's one of the only pumps that we can put that high up and get a sheet of water over the cross the top of the coral. So super valuable, just make sure you clean them a little more frequently. This is actually coming together for me in this one too. This is the next one here is hard lesson, don't wait for death. Don't wait for what Randy did. Yeah, uh, exactly. Stopped, it's, right? I called it a canary coral when actually I shouldn't have been waiting for the canary coral to start dying before I decided that there's something wrong. Yeah, okay, this actually ties together with, uh, we talked about the adaptive reef makes those uh, uh, like a green light and red light telling mm. you things are good, things are bad. Mm -hmm. Also, they have a little audible alarm and the first question you'll have was like, well, why do I need all of those things? Why don't I just have the audible alarm? Because I don't need to be able to, I can hear it. I don't need to see the red thing. Well, so audible alarm could be things like, man, come save me. It could also be the things that show up in your email alerts, right? Emails like, uh, you know, pounding you with like, come save me, come save me. Or right. like your text messages are coming, come save me. And then there's also things that I don't actually want to email 8 million emails or text messages about. I just want to know on Sunday when the time comes, I should go do something about it, which is I can set up an alarm that turns on that little red adaptive reef light on the apex to say, ah. It's time to clean your pump. Time to clean your pumps. I don't need an audible screaming alarm yeah. on that. No. I just need to be told when it's time to so do that. So when I walk by, I go, oh, the pumps must be running at 30% less uh, power than when 100% because my red light's on. It's time to clean it. So that's like a really good point. Is like you could have yeah. two things in your, I could have an actual emergency alarm, like literally it's taking only five watts when it should take 60, yeah. which means the only thing that's actually running is electricity in the box, not mm. the pump. Uh, but I can also at 20 have this little light go on that says, hey, you should probably clean me that's or smart. you're gonna end up like Randy did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another hard lesson here is uh, not using a battery backup and you know it leads up to what we believe matters most was uh would not run it would never run a tank without a power head that has their battery backup we found out and the reason why those two uh play into uh, our beliefs here is because you know 750 xxl was the like two thousand two grand in fish or five grand in fish or however much it was lost uh because we had we had vortex pumps on there they have the best battery backups out there we failed to put them on. We didn't have the Apex heartbeat on to tell us that the uh, Apex was disconnected and the GFCI broke. What we're left with is dead fish when we come here. And we forgot, uh, we just didn't use the battery backup. Do not let that happen to you. You don't have to learn the way that we do. You can choose a different Gosh, path. That was <laughs> such really a hard did. day. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, a couple of other ones here is a hard lesson. Brand loyalty, throw it in the trash. Like it doesn't, Ecotech doesn't make the best stuff. Uh, Mac Spec doesn't make the best stuff. Uh, the yeah. Wave isn't the best thing. Now pick the right tool for the right job and decide what it is you want this tool to do and then pick the job that does that. If, it's, if I need to be able to aim it, it's probably the tunes. If I need really light, gentle flow, it's probably the Ciche Extreme. If I don't want to see the cords, I want to be able to go after the bottom and maintenance really matters to me, it's probably the Vortec. Mm -hmm. If I need sheets of water, it doesn't maintenance, doesn't matter, man. It's probably the gyre. Right, yeah. So don't get stuck on brand loyalty and any one of these things makes a better option than the other they all make something better for a different application than the other ones. Use it as such. Uh, 
Oceans Direct Blows All Over is a hard lesson learned. That's uh, the sand that you had chosen. We got three bags of it going uh, yep. with, the, uh, with the Dream Reef. Um, but Oceans Direct is, uh, you know, it's a type of sand that uh, isn't sifted into very specific granular sizes. That's where your special grade comes from. That's where your oolite comes from. Uh, your Fiji Peak has some pink quartz in there, what have you. Uh, but it's not a uniform size sand. It's a uh, little bit of, little bit of small, a little bit of big, a little bit of bigger. Mixed in, it does blow around. So in that spirit, like a lot of people were like, well, what if I put uh, oolite in my tank and then I just, uh, in that one spot, or I mix in some bigger stuff. Well, what will happen is all the They'll oolite separate. will blow out and then you'll see a big chunk of bigger stuff in the middle. Maybe that's okay to you, maybe it's not. True story. But no, with high flow, obviously the stuff blows around. Uh, and the next one here is a hard lesson uh, that I don't think, this is just starting to come out uh, into a, like a wider accepted uh, conversation. No amount of pumps will get past a poorly designed aquascape. Man, could you man? Okay, so we talked about you know eliminating those dead spots is kind of is the goal when it comes to flow and things like that. You know how hard it is to eliminate dead spots when you built your aquascape poorly, where there's nothing but places for water to stop flowing. Extremely hard. You know how many pumps it's going to take to do that versus if you made a smart, if you smart built a smarter aquascape with this flow in mind. Uh, the hurdle to jump over of getting flow in all of the different places has now lowered significantly. So in many cases, if we uh, build the wall type, just stack the rocks against stack the back, rock. really the only place to apply flow is two pumps same aimed at each other. And yeah. the, in the front, we just kind of hope that it does whatever it's going to do. Yeah. But Everything all the water and through it, all the water in it is stagnant, and all of the garbage that settles out there, stagnant, will never be flushed out. It'll just sit there and rot. All the stuff behind it will do the exact same thing. And so uh, when I say poor aquascape, you can just decide for yourself what that means. But like, if you're building your aquascape, think, how would I apply flow to this aquascape? Mm. And if you at least have that question in mind, you'll produce a better result. Because you can see, I mean, once you get used to seeing the flow and flow patterns and dead spots and tanks, and you, I would challenge you to go, uh, whenever you come up on tanks, like look, why, when you're looking at a tank and you're uh, admiring the tank, uh, just take notice of where the dead spots are in that tank. And you can apply that next time you build an aquascape. Like, huh, I don't think I'll ever build one of those cove type uh, cove things with an overhang over the top of it. Because guess what? There's no flow happening right there in that cove. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna re I'm gonna rephrase. When I said no amount of pumps will get past a uh, poor aquascape, a lot of pumps. I'm just gonna say it will take a lot more pumps to get proper flow in a poorly designed aquascape yeah. than it would in a good one. Uh, and again, good, bad is all about your specific desires. But if you think about flow when you're building it. It will almost be, um, it will absolutely be better than if you didn't think about it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, another piece here, hard lesson, is installing it once and thinking that you're done forever and not adapting the flow to coral growth because what was a bunch of open area with a little bunch of nubbins on it, all of a sudden isn't the same when that coral right here, my favorite one, is now blocked the flow from this side and this side and this side. Well now, some of my favorite corals are not getting the flow they need because the other corals next to it are blocking it. Yeah. I may need to add extra pumps. And I got news for you, a colony of a frag that costs 100 bucks that is now a big old eight inch colony uh, costs 10 times what the pump costs to point at it. <laughs> uh, and so think about it in the frame of mind that it's more of a journey uh, and that I need to you know, evolve my approach to flow as the coral yeah. changes the needs for the flow yeah. and the flow patterns because it might be different over time. And I think in the future, like as we explore flow and the different flow patterns that comes from pumps and what, you know, when you would apply it and what situations you would apply it, this is, this is going to be easier to do as you get, uh, as you, you know, grow in the hobby and your tank grows. Like, uh, if, I, if I'm thinking, you know, all right, from back when this 160 was in its first year versus where we are now in, in six and some change years, uh, 
you know, I wouldn't have considered, I probably wouldn't have considered the gyre uh, as uh, if in the initial. And we didn't consider the gyre in the initial. There was four tunes that started this tank. Now there's, you know, four MP40s and two gyres on either side. And uh, all of those needed because the, the way that the coral grew. Flow behind it with two MP40s, flow in front of it with two MP40s, and flow over the top of it to account for the fact that we don't have little one-inch nubbins in here. We have yeah. big, giant colonies, some of them over a foot across, that just wouldn't do well if we mm. decided that we were just going to put two pumps in the front and call it a day. Tanks aren't set it and forget it. Yeah, you learn and adapt with it. So the big question uh, right now is, uh, what is next? And it'll be episode 10 tomorrow the, of 52 Weeks of Reefing, now live uh, as we discuss it. So come back tomorrow at noon and you will see the next edition of everything we have to share, the next days. evolution of reefing tomorrow at noon.